Section 1 of Report of the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island. Report of the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms. Submitted to the President of the United States, the Secretary of the Treasury, and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. January 1988 Preface The written presentation of the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms consists of two parts. The first is the report, which contains a discussion of findings and recommendations. It is organized into eight chapters and an appendix. Chapter 1 contains the introduction. Chapter 2 summarizes the various marketplaces in which equity instruments are traded, the instruments, the trading strategies used, index arbitrage, portfolio insurance, and the like, and the regulation of the markets. Chapter 3 summarizes the extended rise in stock market values that preceded the October market break. Chapter 4 contains a detailed analysis of the events of the October market break. Chapter 5 analyzes the performance of markets and market makers during the critical period. Chapter 6 describes the fundamental interconnections of events and performance among the various equity marketplaces. Chapter 7 outlines the regulatory implications of the data and analysis contained in the earlier sections. Chapter 8 presents conclusions and recommendations. Finally, the appendix discusses certain other regulatory issues the task force believes merit consideration, but about which it makes no specific recommendations. The second part of this written presentation consists of eight staff studies which contain the detailed information which the task force considered. The studies are 1. The Global Bull Market 2. Historical Perspectives 3. The October Market Break, October 14th through October 20th 4. The Effect of the Stock Market Decline on the Mutual Funds Industry 5. Surveys of Market Participants and Other Interested Parties 6. Performance of the Equity Market During the October Market Break and regulatory overview. 7. The economic impact of the market break. 8. A comparison of 1929 and 1987. We wish to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts of the many individuals on the staff, each of whom worked extremely long hours, under difficult time pressures, and at great personal and professional cost. They were each dedicated to the work of the task force, and their hard work, wisdom, and judgment contributed immensely to our efforts. We also wish to thank the U.S. Department of the Treasury, which provided the significant support staff listed below, and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which provided our working quarters. Finally, the task force wishes to acknowledge the generous contribution that the institutions and firms listed below made to the task force by providing, on a pro bono basis, our staff as well as other support services. Executive Summary Introduction From the close of trading Tuesday, October 13, 1987, to the close of trading Monday, October 19, the Dow Jones Industrial Average declined by almost one-third, representing a loss in the value of all outstanding United States stocks of approximately $1 trillion. What made this market break extraordinary was the speed with which prices fell, the unprecedented volume of trading, and the consequent threat to the financial system. In response to these events, the President created the Task Force on Market Mechanisms. Its mandate was, in 60 days, to determine what happened and why, and to provide guidance in helping to prevent such a break from happening again. 
the market break. The precipitous market decline of mid-October was triggered by specific events, an unexpectedly high merchandise trade deficit which pushed interest rates to new high levels and proposed tax legislation which led to the collapse of the stocks of a number of takeover candidates. This initial decline ignited mechanical, price-insensitive selling by a number of institutions employing portfolio insurance strategies and a small number of mutual fund groups reacting to redemptions. The selling by these investors and the prospect of further selling by them encouraged a number of aggressive trading-oriented institutions to sell in anticipation of further market declines. These institutions included, in addition to hedge funds, a small number of pension and endowment funds, money management firms, and investment banking houses. This selling, in turn, stimulated further reactive selling by portfolio insurers and mutual funds. Portfolio insurers and other institutions sold in both the stock market and the stock index futures market. Selling pressure in the futures market was transmitted to the stock market by the mechanism of index arbitrage. Throughout the period of the decline, trading volume and price volatility increased dramatically. This trading activity was concentrated in the hands of a surprisingly few institutions. On October 19th, sell programs by three portfolio insurers accounted for just under $2 billion in the stock market. In the futures market, three portfolio insurers accounted for the equivalent in value of $2.8 billion of stock. Block sales by a few mutual funds accounted for about $900 million of stock sales. The stock and futures market handled record volume of transactions and had a generally good record of remaining available for trading on October 19th and 20th. However, market makers were unable to manage smooth price transitions in the face of overwhelming selling pressure. Clearing and credit system problems further exacerbated the difficulties of market participants. While no default occurred, the possibility that a clearinghouse or a major investment banking firm might default or that the banking system would deny required liquidity to the market participants resulted in certain market makers curtailing their activities and increased investor uncertainty. Timely intervention by the Federal Reserve System provided confidence and liquidity to the markets and financial system. One Market Analysis of market behavior during the mid-October break makes clear an important conclusion. From an economic viewpoint, what have been traditionally seen as separate markets the markets for stocks, stock index futures, and stock options are in fact one market. Under ordinary circumstances, these marketplaces move sympathetically, linked by financial instruments, trading strategies, market participants, and clearing and credit mechanisms. To a large extent, the problems of mid-October can be traced to the failure of these market segments to act as one. Confronted with the massive selling demands of a limited number of institutions, regulatory and institutional structures designed for separate marketplaces were incapable of effectively responding to intermarket pressures. The New York Stock Exchange's NYSE Automated Transaction System, DOT, used by index arbitrageurs to link the two marketplaces, ceased to be useful for arbitrage after midday on October 19th. The concern that some clearinghouses and major market participants might fail inhibited intermarket activities of other investors. 
the futures and stock markets became disengaged, both nearly going into freefall. The ability of the equity market to absorb the huge selling pressure to which it was subjected in mid-October depended on its liquidity, but liquidity sufficient to absorb the limited selling demands of investors became an illusion of liquidity when confronted by massive selling, as everyone showed up on the same side of the market at once. Ironically, it was this illusion of liquidity which led certain similarly motivated investors, such as portfolio insurers, to adopt strategies which call for liquidity far in excess of what the market could supply. Regulatory Implications Because stocks, futures, and options constitute one market, there must be in place a regulatory structure designed to be consistent with this economic reality. The October market break illustrates that regulatory changes derived from the one market concept are necessary both to reduce the possibility of destructive market breaks and to deal effectively with such episodes should they occur. The guiding objective should be to enhance the integrity and competitiveness of U.S. financial markets. Analysis of the October market break demonstrates that one agency must have the authority to coordinate a few critical intermarket issues, cutting across market segments and affecting the entire financial system, to monitor activities of all market segments, and to mediate concerns across marketplaces. The specific issues which have an impact across marketplaces and throughout the financial system include clearing and credit mechanisms, margin requirements, circuit breaker mechanisms such as price limits and trading halts, and information systems for monitoring activities across marketplaces. The single agency required to coordinate cross-marketplace issues must have broad and deep expertise in the interaction of the stock, stock option, and stock index futures marketplaces, as well as in all financial markets, domestic and global. It must have broad expertise in the financial system as a whole. The task force compared these requirements with possible alternative regulatory structures, including existing self-regulatory organizations, such as the exchanges, existing government regulatory agencies, namely the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the Department of the Treasury, the Federal Reserve Board, a combination of two or more of these, and a new regulatory body. Conclusion Our understanding of these events leads directly to our recommendations. To help prevent a repetition of the events of mid-October and to provide an effective and coordinated response in the face of market disorder, we recommend one agency should coordinate the few but critical regulatory issues which have an impact across the related market segments and throughout the financial system. Clearing systems should be unified across marketplaces to reduce financial risk. Margins should be made consistent across marketplaces to control speculation and financial leverage. Circuit breaker mechanisms, such as price limits and coordinated trading halts, should be formulated and implemented to protect the market system. Information systems should be established to monitor transactions and conditions in related markets. 
The single agency must have expertise in the interaction of markets, not simply experience in regulating distinct market segments. It must have a broad perspective on the financial system as a whole, both domestic and foreign, as well as independence and responsiveness. The task force had neither the time nor the mandate to consider the full range of issues necessary to support a definitive recommendation on the choice of agency to assume the required role. However, the weight of the evidence suggests that the Federal Reserve is well qualified to fill that role. Other Issues Certain other issues were discussed by the task force without reaching definitive conclusions. The task force identified the following issues as warranting review by the appropriate authorities. Short Selling There are restrictions on short selling in the stock market, but not in the futures or options markets. Linkages such as index arbitrage among these markets may operate to incapacitate the short-selling restriction. This issue should be reviewed from an intermarket perspective. Customer versus proprietary trading. Under certain circumstances, broker-dealers and futures market makers can act as principal for their own account as well as execute customer orders. Potential problems posed by the opportunity to trade in anticipation of customer orders in different marketplaces should also be reviewed from an intermarket perspective. NYSE Specialists The adequacy of specialist capital and specialist performance in meeting their responsibility to maintain a fair and orderly market are issues raised by the October market experience. NYSE order imbalances. When there are serious imbalances of orders, consideration should be given to favoring public customers in execution over institutional and other proprietary orders through the DOT system and to making the specialist book public to help attract the other side of the imbalance. Chapter 1. Introduction From the close of trading on Tuesday, October 13, 1987, to the close of trading on October 19, 1987, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, Dow, fell 769 points, or 31%. In those four days of trading, the value of all outstanding U.S. stocks decreased by almost $1 trillion. On October 19, 1987 alone, the Dow fell by 508 points, or 22.6%. Since the early 1920s, only the drop of 12.8% in the Dow on October 28, 1929, and the fall of 11.7% the following day, which together constituted the crash of 1929, have approached the October 19th decline in magnitude. The significance of this decline lies in the role that the stock market plays in a modern industrial economy, both as a harbinger and a facilitator of economic activity. Stock price levels can have an important effect on the confidence and, hence, the behavior of both businesses and households. Further, equity markets are a primary means by which businesses and industries raise capital to finance growth and provide jobs. Gross sales of newly issued common stock increased substantially over the course of the 1982-1987 bull market, reaching 
$56.3 billion in 1986 and $27 billion in the first six months of 1987. However, the importance of stock sales is greater than simply the amount of funds raised. New equity capital and public equity markets are essential to financing innovative business ventures, which are a primary engine of the nation's economic growth. Moreover, Publicly traded equities are a repository of a significant fraction of U.S. household wealth. Households directly own about 60% of all U.S. publicly owned common stock, which was worth approximately $2.25 trillion before the October market decline. Households hold another 210 billion dollars of common stock through mutual funds and 740 billion dollars through pension funds. Thus, in the early fall of 1987, the stock market accounted for approximately 3.2 trillion dollars worth of household wealth. Equity markets are also inextricably tied to the wider financial system through the structure of banks and other financial institutions. Given the importance of equity markets to the economy and to the public, effectively structured and functioning equity markets are critical. Consequently, in response to October's extraordinary events, the President created a task force on market mechanisms, the purpose of which was to, quote, review relevant analyses of the current and long-term financial condition of the nation's securities markets, identify problems that may threaten the short-term liquidity or long-term solvency of such markets, analyze potential solutions to such problems that will both assure the continued functioning of free, fair, and competitive securities markets and maintain investor confidence in such markets, and provide appropriate recommendations to the President, to the Secretary of the Treasury, and to the Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. End quote. What made the October market break extraordinary was the speed with which prices fell, the unprecedented volume of trading and the consequent dislocations of the financial markets. Thus, whatever the causes of the original downward pressure on the equity market, the mandate of the task force was to focus on those factors which transformed this downward pressure into the alarming events of the stock market decline and to recommend measures to ensure, as far as possible, that future market fluctuations are not of the extreme and potentially destructive nature witnessed in October 1987. Fundamental causes of the recent market decline should not, of course, be ignored. To the extent that existing imbalances in the budget, foreign transactions, savings, corporate asset positions, and other fundamental factors are perceived to be problems, they merit attention. The events of October demonstrated an unusual frailty in the markets. Only 3% of the total shares of publicly traded stock in the U.S. changed hands during this period, but it resulted in the loss in stock value of $1 trillion. That such a relatively small transaction volume can produce such a large loss in value over such a short time span suggests the importance of determining the extent to which market mechanisms themselves were an important factor in the October market break. The work of the task force, therefore, focused on the individual marketplaces and the interrelationship of existing market mechanisms, including the instruments traded, the strategies employed, 
and the regulatory structures. The task force's findings and conclusions are based significantly on the primary transaction data and information that we accumulated. Recognizing the importance of determining as much as possible about each transaction, the task force spent much of its time gathering and then analyzing transactions on the New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, CME, Chicago Board of Trade, CBOT, American Stock Exchange, Amex, and the Chicago Board Options Exchange, CBOE, as a vehicle for expanding on and cross-referencing this exchange data, the task force analyzed information on transactions supplied to the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, CFTC. In addition, we received information directly from certain major investment banks and institutional investors. Finally, the task force spoke in person with hundreds of market participants in order to understand better their perspectives on individual transactions and all the events of the October 1987 decline. End of Section 1 Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island Section 2 of Report of the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island Chapter 2 Instruments, Markets, Regulation and Trading Strategies This chapter is designed to serve as a brief introductory guide for readers less familiar with the instruments, marketplaces, and trading strategies important to an understanding the events of mid-October. A more complete discussion is presented in Study 6. Stocks, Futures Contracts, and Options Contracts Shares of stock are claims of ownership in corporations. The price of a stock in effectively operating stock markets depends largely on the current performance and future earnings prospects of a corporation. Futures contracts and options contracts are not corporate ownership claims. They are derivative instruments whose value depends primarily on the underlying price of the stock or portfolio of stocks from which they are derived. The most heavily traded equity-related futures and options contracts are based upon certain standardized portfolios of stock, such as the Standard & Poor's 500 Stock Index, S&P 500, the Standard & Poor's 100 Stock Index, S&P 100, and the Major Market Index of 20 Stocks, MMI. Exchanges and Market Making Stocks are traded on the New York Stock Exchange and American Stock Exchange, as well as on several other exchanges throughout the country. Other stocks are traded in the over-the-counter OTC market, a dealer market connected by computers and telephones. The S&P 500 futures contract is traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and the MMI futures contract is traded on the Chicago Board of Trade. The preponderance of the daily volume of index futures trading takes place on the CME. Although the value of open interest in the futures contracts is only a small fraction of the value of NYSE stocks. The value of the stocks represented by the volume of futures contracts traded on the CME daily is typically about twice the value of stocks traded on the NYSE daily. 
Options contracts on the S&P 100 are traded on the Chicago Board Options Exchange. The Amex trades an option on the MMI. Options whose value is related to individual stocks are also traded on various exchanges. A specialist system is used by the various stock exchanges for exchange-listed stocks. Under the specialist system, a single dealer is given the right to make the market in a specific stock or option on the exchange. In return, the specialist assumes the responsibility to make an orderly market by buying and selling from inventory. In the competitive market maker system, competing dealers set the price of an options or futures contract in an auction process. A competitive market maker system is used by the CBOE for options and by the CME and the CBOT for futures. The OTC also uses a competing dealer system to make markets. A hybrid system employing both specialists and competing market makers is used for options sponsored by the stock exchanges. Regulation the stock, futures, and options exchanges organize, manage, promote, and oversee the individual stock and derivative contract markets. They set and enforce rules regarding trading practices, monitor the financial resources and obligations of participants, and supervise the settlement of transactions. There is a system of federal regulatory oversight which requires or prohibits particular rules and practices, approves rule changes, and audits the exchanges, trading, and financial surveillance. The Securities and Exchange Commission has responsibility for stocks and options. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission oversees futures. Margin Customers of futures commission merchants and broker-dealers in stock markets must post collateral, called margin, consisting of cash and securities, against their obligations. These obligations are twofold. First, they are loans from a broker-dealer to purchase stock. Second, they are obligations created by a short sale of stock the purchase or sale of a futures contract, and the sale of an options contract. The equity balance of a customer's margin account equal to the difference between the market value of securities and the amount of the loan or other obligation is calculated each day. The equity value must be greater than the margin requirement. Otherwise, the broker-dealer may call for more margin or sell the customer's positions. The Federal Reserve has final authority for setting initial margin requirements for stocks and options. The individual commodity exchanges have the authority to set margins in the futures contracts traded on their floors. Clearing Trades executed on an exchange are guaranteed by a clearinghouse, whose performance is in turn guaranteed to varying degrees by the clearing members, broker-dealers, or futures commission merchants of that exchange. Most U.S. stock exchanges clear their transactions through a single stock clearinghouse. Similarly, all U.S. options exchanges clear through a single options clearinghouse. In contrast, each of the largest futures exchanges maintains its own clearinghouse. Trading Strategies The price of an index futures contract and the price of the stock index portfolio underlying it are directly related. 
Normally, the price of a futures contract exceeds the price of the underlying portfolio by an amount reflecting the cost of carry, which relates to the difference between the treasury bill rate and the dividend yield on the portfolio. And index arbitrageur attempts to profit when the price difference is abnormal, either by simultaneously buying futures contracts and selling the index portfolio of stocks, or by doing the reverse. When the futures price is at a discount, the arbitrageur engages in index substitution by selling an index portfolio of stocks and replacing it with futures contracts. This is typically done by a pension fund which owns an indexed portfolio of stocks. In executing this arbitrage, the institution takes on whatever greater credit risk there is in owning the futures contract rather than the stocks themselves. When the futures contract is at a premium, the arbitrageur may execute a synthetic cash transaction, buying the stock portfolio and selling futures. Typically, a corporation holding short-term money market investments would perform this arbitrage to increase its yield. There are also a number of non-arbitrage trading strategies which involve stocks and futures contracts. First, when trading-oriented investors want to trade on the direction of the market as a whole, they often buy or sell index futures because futures transactions can be executed more quickly and cheaply than transactions involving a diversified portfolio of stocks. Lower transaction costs and lower margin requirements make this possible. Second, longer-term investors often find it faster and initially cheaper to initiate portfolio position changes through the futures market. Eventually, the futures position is replaced with stocks. Third, block traders, exchange specialists, and investment bankers marketing new stock issues can use index futures to hedge their positions. Other strategies are designed to react mechanically to market movements by selling in a falling market and buying in a rising market. One such strategy, portfolio insurance, is designed to allow institutional investors to participate in a rising market yet protect their portfolio as the market falls. Using computer-based models derived from stock options analysis, portfolio insurance vendors compute optimal stock-to-cash ratios at various stock market price levels. But rather than buying and selling stocks as the market moves, most portfolio insurers adjust the stock-to-cash ratio by trading index futures. Indeed, several major portfolio insurance vendors have been authorized to trade only futures and have no access to their clients' stock portfolios. Some option hedging strategies employed by options traders use the same method of buying futures as the market rises and selling futures as the market falls. Underlying many of these strategies is the ability to use stock index futures to trade the entire stock market as if it were a single commodity. Futures contracts make it possible to do this quickly, efficiently, and cheaply. However, to the extent that they do this, traders and investors treat the stock market as if it were a single commodity 
rather than a collection of individual stocks. End of chapter two. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island. Section three of Report of the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island. Chapter three. The Bull Market. All major stock markets began an impressive period of growth in 1982. Spurred by the economic turnaround, the growth in corporate earnings, the reduction in inflation, and the associated fall in interest rates, the Dow rose from 777 to 1,896 between August 1982 and December 1986. Other factors contributing to this dramatic bull market included continuing deregulation of the financial markets, tax incentives for equity investing, stock retirements arising from mergers, leveraged buyouts and share repurchase programs, and an increasing tendency to include takeover premiums in the valuation of a large number of stocks. Despite the dramatic rise in the market, stock valuation at the end of 1986 was not out of line with levels achieved in past periods. 1987 Stocks in the U.S. continued to appreciate rapidly during the first eight months of 1987, despite rapidly increasing interest rates. When the Dow reached its peak of 2,722 in August, stocks were valued at levels which challenged historical precedent and fundamental justification. Factors which contributed to this final rise included, in addition to those listed earlier, increased foreign investment in U.S. equities and growing investment in common stock mutual funds. The rapid rise in the popularity of portfolio insurance strategies also contributed to the market's rise. Pension fund managers adopting these strategies typically increased the fund's risk exposure by investing more heavily in common stock during this rising market. The rationale was that portfolio insurance would cushion the impact of a market break by allowing them to shift quickly out of stocks. During this period, the OTC market also advanced rapidly, and institutional participation and trading volume rose. The OTC and NYSE increasingly moved in parallel, with relative price levels in one matching those in the other. Moreover, volatility in all the U.S. equity markets increased somewhat during this period. However, prior to October, it was not substantially high by historical standards, and increases in U.S. stock market volatility were comparable to increases in volatility in foreign markets. International Equity Markets Foreign stock exchanges enjoyed bull markets similar to the U.S. during this period. In Japan, for example, stocks were selling at a ratio of 70 times earnings in October 1987, more than double the price-to-earnings ratio in the beginning of 1986. Aided by significantly improved computer and communications technology, cross-border equity investment increased rapidly during this period. The communications networks of four key data providers alone cover over 100,000 equities, connect over 110 exchanges, and include 300,000 terminals in over 110 countries. In the first nine months 
of 1987 alone, Japanese investment in U.S. equities increased by about $15 billion. As cross-border investment grew, so did U.S. investors' sensitivity to foreign common stock performance. Investors made comparisons of valuations in different countries, often using higher valuations in other countries as justification for investing in lower-valued markets. Consequently, a process of ratcheting up among worldwide stock markets began to develop. In the midst of this globalization of equity investment, trading volume on U.S. markets continued to dominate worldwide trading. Trading on U.S. markets tended to lead other markets around the world. This economic and financial panorama was the backdrop to the October market break in the U.S. End of Chapter 3 Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island Section 4 of Report of the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island Chapter 4 The Market Break Introduction. On Wednesday morning, October 14, 1987, the U.S. equity market began the most severe one-week decline in its history. The Dow stood at over 2,500 on Wednesday morning. By noon on Tuesday of the next week, it was just above 1,700, a decline of almost one-third. Worse still, at the same time on Tuesday, the S&P 500 futures contract would imply a Dow level near 1,400. This precipitous decline began with several triggers, which ignited mechanical, price-insensitive selling by a number of institutions following portfolio insurance strategies and a small number of mutual fund groups. The selling by these investors and the prospect of further selling by them encouraged a number of aggressive trading-oriented institutions to sell in anticipation of further declines. These aggressive trading-oriented institutions included, in addition to hedge funds, a small number of pension and endowment funds, money management firms, and investment banking houses. This selling in turn stimulated further reactive selling by portfolio insurers and mutual funds. Selling pressure in the futures market was transmitted to the stock market by the mechanism of index arbitrage. Throughout the period, trading volume and price volatility increased dramatically. This may suggest that a broad range of investors all decided to reduce their positions in equities. In reality, a limited number of investors played the dominant role during this tumultuous period. The Days Before the Break October 14th to 16th Wednesday, October 14th the stock market's break began with two events which contributed to a revaluation of stock prices and triggered the reactive selling which would exacerbate the decline the following week. At 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, the government announced that the merchandise trade deficit for August was $15.7 billion, approximately $1.5 billion above the figure expected by the financial markets. Within seconds, traders in the foreign exchange markets sold dollars in the belief that the value of the dollar would have to fall further before the deficit could narrow. The German Deutschmark and the Japanese yen rose dramatically in value. 
Treasury bond traders fearing that a weakening dollar could both discourage international investment in U.S. securities and stimulate domestic inflation sold on the London market and on the U.S. bond market when it opened. The Treasury's bellwether 30-year bond began to trade above a 10% yield for the first time in two years. Equity returns at current levels became even less attractive compared to returns on bonds. The second event was the announcement early Wednesday that members of the House Ways and Means Committee were filing legislation to eliminate tax benefits associated with the financing of corporate takeovers. While rumors of the legislation had been circulating on Wall Street for several weeks, its actual announcement had a galvanizing effect on investors, particularly risk arbitrageurs who specialize in buying shares of takeover candidates. As risk arbitrageurs came to appreciate the seriousness of the legislative initiative, they began to liquidate their positions, collapsing the prices of takeover shares. These stocks had led the bull market up, and now, during the week of October 14th to October 20th, they would begin to lead it back down again. In response to these events, the equity market declined immediately on Wednesday's opening. The S&P 500 futures contract fell sharply as trading-oriented investors sold. This was followed by large block sales of individual stocks on the New York Stock Exchange as institutions joined the selling. The Dow dropped 44 points in the first half hour. During this period, Index arbitrage program sales through the NYSE's designated order turnaround dot automated execution system totaled almost $200 million, which was 18% of volume, double the normal level. Index arbitrageurs attempt to profit from price differences in futures and stocks, either by simultaneously buying futures and selling baskets of stock, or vice versa. This arbitrage activity usually has the effect of eliminating the price differences. It also transfers buying or selling pressure between the futures market and the stock market. The morning decline was followed by another 45-point decline between 12.15 p.m. and 1.15 p.m. This midday decline was the result mainly of selling in the futures market by portfolio insurers, and then the transmission of this selling activity back into the stock market by the actions of index arbitrageurs who bought futures and sold stocks. Index arbitrage activity during the hour was $300 million, almost 25% of volume. Portfolio insurance, a strategy using computer-based models, computes optimal stock cash ratios at various market price levels. Rather than buying and selling stocks as the market moves, most portfolio insurers adjust the stock cash ratio within their clients' investment portfolios by trading index futures. Indeed, several major portfolio insurance vendors are authorized to trade only futures and have no access to their clients' stock portfolios. At the end of Wednesday, there was a sell-off by trading-oriented institutions. Institutional sellers moved large blocks in the stock market and sold futures as well. In the last half hour, the Dow fell 17 points. Index arbitrage sales were $140 million, 15% of volume. For the day, 
The Dow was down an historic 95 points on volume of 207 million shares. Of this volume, index arbitrage sales through DOT were $1.4 billion, 17% of volume or twice the normal level. The 20 largest NYSE member firms sold as principal $689 million of stock. Trading-oriented investors in the futures market were net sellers of about $500 million. Portfolio insurance selling was heavy, particularly in early and mid-afternoon. Thursday, October 15th. Selling in Tokyo and London overnight continued the pattern seen in New York and Chicago on Wednesday. When the U.S. markets opened, they were greeted by heavy selling from portfolio insurers. During the first half hour, this group sold approximately 2,500 futures contracts, $380 million, more than 26% of public volume. The Dow opened 20 points down on heavy volume of 48 million shares in the first half hour, with approximately 60% of the trading in large blocks of 10,000 shares or more. Even with the opening drop in the Dow, the futures went to a discount. Despite the opening, the Dow recovered during the day and was down only four points at 3.30 p.m. In the last 30 minutes of trading, however, it fell another 53 points to close down 57 points for the day. This sharp decline on heavy volume so late in the day bewildered investors. Broad-based selling by futures market participants, including portfolio insurers, led the fall, and index arbitrage activity quickly followed to bring the stock market into line. Index arbitrage amounted to almost $175 million in stock sales on the NYSE, and straight selling of stock baskets amounted to another $100 million. Together, the two trading strategies accounted for approximately one quarter of the last half hour's volume on the NYSE. Throughout the day, a concentration of trading activity was evident. Seven aggressive trading institutions sold a total of just over $800 million of stocks, about 9% of NYSE volume. Friday, October 16th. Despite the sell-off at the close on Thursday in the U.S., trading in Tokyo on Friday was quiet. London was closed because of a freak hurricane. Trading in the U.S. markets Friday was affected strongly by the expiration of options on several stock indices. A few firms noted for trading heavily in options were major participants on both sides of the futures market. Because the marked decline in stock prices had made it difficult for options traders to hedge effectively in the options market, much of their activity spilled into the futures market, where they sold futures as a hedge. In so doing, they responded in a manner similar to the reactive decisions of portfolio insurers. All told, Options traders accounted for 7% of gross selling and 6% of gross buying in the futures market. The stock market was relatively quiet until 11 a.m. with the Dow down only 7 points when futures selling by portfolio insurers picked up significantly 
running over 2,000 contracts or $300 million of stock an hour. Index arbitrageurs quickly transmitted this pressure to the stock market, selling $183 million of stock, 18% of NYSE volume. The Dow fell 30 points. The stock market rallied briefly, but then plummeted 70 points between noon and 2 p.m. Index arbitrage selling was active, accounting for about 16% of NYSE volume between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. Large block transactions accounted for about half the volume in the 30 stocks making up the Dow. After a technical trading rally fizzled at about 2.30 p.m., the decline quickened in the last half hour of trading. Between 3.30 p.m. and 3.50 p.m., the Dow fell 50 points, then recovered 22 points in the last 10 minutes of trading. During this last half hour, index arbitrageurs had gross sales of $620 million of stock, and institutions sold $151 million of stock baskets. Together, this $771 million of stock sales through the DOT system made up 45% of NYSE sales volume during this period. The Dow was off 108 points, the largest one-day drop ever, on volume of 338 million shares. Sales by aggressive trading institutions were especially heavy and concentrated. Four of them sold over $600 million of stock in total. To put this in perspective, an investor transacting $10 million on a normal day would be considered an active trader. Portfolio insurers and index arbitrageurs were also active. Five of the top seven net sellers in futures were portfolio insurers. As a group, they accounted for sales equivalent to $2.1 billion of stock. 17% of the non-market maker future sales. Index arbitrageurs transmitted $1.7 billion of selling pressure to the stock market. The three days in perspective. During October 14th to 16th, the Dow fell by over 250 points. The selling was triggered primarily by two proximate causes, disappointingly poor merchandise trade figures, which put downward pressure on the dollar in currency markets and upward pressure on long-term interest rates, and the filing of anti-takeover tax legislation, which caused risk arbitrageurs to sell stocks of takeover candidates, resulting in their precipitate decline and a general ripple effect throughout the market. The market's decline created a huge overhang of selling pressure, enough to crush the equity markets in the following week. This overhang was concentrated within two categories of reactive sellers, portfolio insurers and a few mutual fund groups, and exacerbated by the actions of a number of aggressive trading-oriented institutions selling in anticipation of further declines. An example may help illustrate the extent of the portfolio insurance overhang by Friday's close. One portfolio insurance client had followed exactly the instructions of its advisor during the Wednesday to Friday period. Over the weekend, the advisor informed the client that, based on Friday's market close, it should sell on Monday 70% 
of its remaining equities in order to conform to the parameters of the insurance model. This is, of course, an extreme example, but the typical portfolio insurance model calls for stock sales in excess of 20% of a portfolio in response to a 10% decline in the market. Various sources indicate that 60 to $90 billion of equity assets were under portfolio insurance administration at the time of the market break. Two consequences were evident. First, portfolio insurers were very active sellers during the Wednesday to Friday period. In the futures market, where they concentrated their activity during this week, they sold the equivalent in stocks of approximately $530 million on Wednesday, $965 million on Thursday, and $2.1 billion on Friday. Second, they approached Monday with a huge amount of selling already dictated by their models. With the market already down 10%, their models dictated that, at a minimum, $12 billion, 20% of $60 billion, of equities should already have been sold. Less than $4 billion had in fact been sold. A small number of mutual fund groups were also confronted with an overhang. These funds had designated strategies which made it easy for customers to redeem mutual fund shares. On Friday alone, customer redemptions at these funds exceeded fund sales of stock by $750 million. These customers were entitled to repayment based on market prices at the close on Friday. These funds also received substantial redemption requests over the weekend. The activities of a small number of aggressive trading-oriented institutions both contributed to the decline during this week and posed the prospect of further selling pressure on Monday. These traders could well understand the strategies of the portfolio insurers and mutual funds. They could anticipate the selling those institutions would have to do in reaction to the market's decline. They could also see those institutions falling behind in their selling programs. The situation presented an opportunity for these traders to sell in anticipation of the forced selling by portfolio insurers and mutual funds, with the prospect of repurchasing at lower prices. During this period, these trading-oriented institutions were active, typically on both sides of the market, and often on the same day. On Thursday, seven of these trading-oriented institutions sold a total of just over $800 million of stocks, 9% of NYSE volume. The same institution was the fourth largest seller of stocks and the second largest buyer. This institution also ranked third and fourth, respectively, in future sales and purchases and was active in options trading. On Friday, seven aggressive trading-oriented institutions sold more than $100 million each. Four of the seven also bought more than $100 million. That day, traders as a group sold $1.4 billion of stocks and bought $1.1 billion. Their activities on these days were a prelude to Monday's sell-off. Index arbitrage was active throughout the three-day period 
to transmit selling pressure from the futures market to the stock market. But as several charts make apparent, it was the timing of arbitrage activities rather than the aggregate daily level, which had specific impact on the stock market. Heavy index arbitrage activity was most often coincident with substantial intraday stock market moves. Monday, October 19th. In Tokyo, the Nikkei index, Japan's equivalent of the Dow, fell 2.5%. Investors in London sold shares heavily, and by midday, the market index there was down 10%. Selling of U.S. stocks on the London market was stoked by some U.S. mutual fund managers who tried to beat the expected selling on the NYSE by lightening up in London. One mutual fund group sold just under $90 million of stocks in London. Selling activity shifted to the U.S. when the equity markets opened. At 9.15 a.m., the MMI futures opened down 2.5% from an already weak close on Friday. Fifteen minutes later, the S&P 500 futures also opened down under heavy selling pressure by portfolio insurers. During the first half hour of trading, a few portfolio insurers sold futures equivalent to just under $400 million of stocks, 28% of the public volume. By the scheduled 9.30 a.m. opening on the NYSE, specialists faced large order imbalances. In the dot system alone, almost $500 million of market sell orders were loaded before the market opened. Of this total, $250 million were sales by index arbitrageurs responding to an apparent record futures discount. The remaining $250 million included straight sell programs by a few portfolio insurers permitted by their clients to sell stocks as well as futures. This group would sell more or less consistently from the opening to the closing bell. There were also large sell orders on the floor for blocks of individual stocks by a small number of mutual funds. Faced with this massive order imbalance, many specialists did not open trading in their stocks during the first hour. Nevertheless, volume was impressive. In the first half hour alone, about $2 billion crossed the tape. Of this total, about $500 million, roughly 25% of volume in this period, came from one mutual fund group. Slightly less came from the execution of orders in the DOT system for index arbitrageurs and portfolio insurers. In addition, even as these trades were being executed through DOT, another 500 million of sell orders were being loaded into the system backlog. Thus, Sell orders from a few institutional traders overwhelmed the stock market at the opening. During the first hour, the reported levels of the S&P and Dow indices reflected out-of-date Friday closing prices for the large number of stocks, which had not yet been opened for trading. The result was an apparent record discount for the futures relative to stocks. Based on this apparent discount, index arbitrageurs entered sell-at-market orders through DOT, planning to cover by later purchases of futures at lower prices. However, 
specialists ultimately opened their stocks at sharply lower levels, in line with the prices at which futures had opened earlier. As this fact became evident, index arbitrageurs realized they had sold stock at prices lower than expected. By 10.30 a.m., when most stocks had opened, the Dow was around 2,150 compared with the Friday close of near 2,250. Starting around 10.50 a.m., these arbitrageurs rushed to cover their positions through purchases of futures. The result was an immediate rise in the futures market. By 11 a.m., futures were at a premium, and the stock market, in turn, began an hour-long rally. Even as the futures and then the stock markets rallied, one portfolio insurance client began to modify its selling strategy in response to the anticipated volume of sales. On previous days and during the first hour of Monday, this institutional investor had relied on futures sales as the method to increase its cash position. Around 10.30 a.m., this institution augmented futures sales with straight stock-sell programs through DOT. These sales of stock baskets by this institution would ultimately continue in 13 waves of almost $100 million each until about 2 p.m. and total just under $1.1 billion. Thus, one hour into the trading day, two mechanisms were operating at high volume through DOT to transmit futures selling pressure to the stock market, index arbitrage, and the diversion of portfolio insurance sales from the futures market into straight stock sell programs. In New York, the stock exchange traded about $21 billion of stock. In Chicago, the CME traded futures equivalent to almost $20 billion, of which about 50% was trading by public customers, including trading by specialists and market makers, Almost $41 billion of stock, or equivalent futures, was traded on these exchanges. The selling pressure in futures led to discounts of historic size. In response to these huge discounts, three mechanisms came into play to transmit selling pressure from futures to stocks. First, index arbitrage executed $1.7 billion of program sales through DOT, matched by equivalent futures purchases. Second, there were additional straight program sales of stock equal to $2.3 billion. Most of this was portfolio insurance selling diverted from the futures market to the stock market by the large discount. Taken together, arbitrage programs and straight sell programs totaled $4 billion, almost 20% of the sales on the first 600 million share day in the NYSE's history. These program sales would no doubt have been even higher if the DOT system had functioned more effectively after 2 p.m. Third, some undeterminate portion of the $41 billion of purchases was diverted from more expensive stocks to cheaper futures. Starting around 11.40 a.m., Portfolio insurance sales overwhelmed the rally. Between then and 2 p.m., the Dow fell from 2,140 to 1,950, a decline of just under 9%. 
The last 100 points of this decline occurred after reports began circulating that the NYSE might close. The break below 2000 was the first time this level had been penetrated since January 7, 1987. Over these two hours, the futures index fell 14.5%. Portfolio insurance activity intensified. Between 11.40 a.m. and 2 p.m. in the futures market, portfolio insurers sold approximately 10,000 contracts, equivalent to about $1.3 billion, and representing about 41% of futures volume exclusive of market makers, in other words, locals. In addition, portfolio insurers authorized to sell stock directly sold approximately $900 million in stocks on the NYSE during this period. In the stock and futures markets combined, portfolio insurers contributed over $3.7 billion in selling pressure by early afternoon. Throughout most of this period, Index arbitrage had succeeded in transmitting futures selling pressure back to the stock market. After about 2 p.m., index arbitrage slowed because of concerns about delays in DOT and the consequent ineffective execution of basket sales. Another source of sales through DOT stopped at around 2 p.m., when the one institution which had already sold 13 baskets of stock, each worth under just $100 million, discontinued its sell program. Up until this hour, index arbitrage and straight program selling totaled $3.2 billion. Relieved of these selling pressures, the stock market enjoyed a brief respite. The Dow rallied back to the psychologically important 2,000-point level by 2.45 p.m. The result of the withdrawal of some index arbitrage and diverted portfolio insurer sales from the DOT system was that neither mechanism was sufficient to keep the stock and futures markets from disconnecting. Enormous discounts of futures relative to stocks were free to develop as the futures market plummeted, disconnected from the stock market. The rest of Monday afternoon was disastrous. Heavy futures selling continued by a few portfolio insurers. In the last hour and one half of futures trading, these institutions sold 6,000 contracts, the equivalent of $660 million of stock. With some index arbitrageurs unwilling to sell stock through DOT, they also withdrew from the futures side of their trading, denying buying support to the futures market allowing it to fall to a discount of 20 index points. In addition, the appearance of this dysfunctionally large discount inhibited buyers in the stock market. With these stock buyers gone, the Dow sank almost 300 points in the last hour and one quarter of stock trading to close at 1,738. Portfolio insurance futures selling continued even after stocks closed. All told, Monday, October 19, was perhaps the worst day in the history of U.S. equity markets. By the close of trading, the Dow Index had fallen 508 points, almost 23% on volume of 604 million shares, worth just under 
$21 billion. Even worse, the S&P 500 futures had fallen 29% on total volume of 162,000 contracts, valued at almost $20 billion. This record volume was concentrated among relatively few institutions. In the stock market, the top four sellers alone accounted for $2.85 billion, or 14% of total sales. The top 15 sellers as a group accounted for $4.1 billion, or about 20% of total sales. The top 15 buyers purchased $2.2 billion, almost 11% of total volume. In the futures market, the top 10 sellers accounted for sales equivalent to $5 billion, roughly 50% of the non-market maker total volume. The contribution of a small number of portfolio insurers and mutual funds to the Monday selling pressure is even more striking. Out of total NYSE sales of just under $21 billion, sell programs by three portfolio insurers made up just under $2 billion. Block sales of individual stocks by a few mutual funds accounted for another $900 million. About 90% of these sales were executed by one mutual fund group. In the futures market, portfolio insurer sales amounted to the equivalent of $4 billion of stocks, or 34,500 contracts, equal to over 40% of futures volume, exclusive of locals transactions. $2.8 billion was done by only three insurers. In the stock and futures markets together, one portfolio insurer sold stock and futures with underlying values totaling $1.7 billion. Huge as this selling pressure from portfolio insurers was, it was a small fraction of the sales dictated by the formulas of their models. Tuesday, October 20th. Overnight, the Tokyo and London stock markets declined dramatically, falling just under 15%. In the U.S., the Federal Reserve issued a statement just before the equity market's opening that it would provide needed liquidity to the financial system. On U.S. equity markets, the start of trading Tuesday stood in marked contrast to Monday. Both stock and futures markets opened with dramatic rises. On the NYSE, many stocks could not open due to buy-side order imbalances. The majority of these imbalances were made up of market orders primarily from value-oriented investors and traders with short stock or futures positions. The NYSE specialists, burdened with more than $1 billion in stock inventories at Monday's close, opened stocks at higher levels and reduced their inventories. In the first hour, the Dow Index rose just under 200 points. In the futures market, the S&P 500 contract opened up 10% at 223. Buying pressure came from aggressive trading-oriented institutions who wanted to buy the market but were unsure how quickly they could get execution on the NYSE. Buying pressure also came from traders wanting to close out short positions after hearing rumors about the financial viability 
of the CME's clearinghouse. These rumors were unfounded, although two New York investment banks had to wait until late in the afternoon before receiving variation margin payments totaling about $1.5 billion from the CME clearinghouse. The rumors did affect Tuesday's trading, with futures volume dropping 22% below Monday's level. The morning rally in the futures market ended abruptly at 10 a.m., as heavy selling by portfolio insurers and traders overwhelmed buying. Portfolio insurance selling in the first hour totaled the equivalent of almost $900 million of stock. The futures contract quickly moved to an enormous discount, as large as 40 index points, as the market went into freefall, plummeting 27% between 10 a.m. and 12.15 p.m. By the end of this period, portfolio insurance sales for the day totaled the equivalent of $1.75 billion of stock. By the end of the day, it added up to 40% of futures activity of public sellers. At its low, the S&P 500 futures contract price implied a Dow level of about 1,400. Contributing greatly to this freefall was the lack of index arbitrage buying, which would normally have been stimulated by the huge discount of futures to stock. At its opening, the NYSE had prohibited broker-dealers from using the DOT system to execute index arbitrage orders for their own accounts. As on Monday afternoon, the primary linkage between the two markets had been disconnected. The stock market also ran out of buying support by mid-morning and began to follow the futures market down. Although individual stocks were opening and closing again at various times all morning and early afternoon, record or near-record volume was executed in every half-hour period. During the first two hours, 259 million shares were traded. Selling pressure was widespread, much of it from mutual funds who were dealing with expected redemptions, portfolio insurers who were switching from selling futures to selling stocks, and some index arbitrageurs. In addition, the large discount between futures and stocks acted as a billboard, worrying many investors that further declines were imminent. By 12.30 p.m., the Dow had fallen to just above 1,700. At this point, a number of exchanges closed trading temporarily. The CBOE suspended trading at 11.45 a.m. based on its rule that trading on the NYSE must be open in at least 80% of the stocks which constitute the options index it trades. At 12.15 p.m., the CME announced a trading suspension in reaction to individual stock closings on the NYSE and the rumor of the imminent closing of the NYSE itself. During Tuesday morning, the dynamics of trading in stocks and futures had become dysfunctional. The futures market was falling under selling pressure from portfolio insurers. Normally, the large discount would have attracted buyers. Under the current circumstances, however, some potential buyers were afraid of the credit risk perceived to exist in futures, and many stock investors were simply not authorized to buy futures. In addition, index arbitrage activity 
was limited because DOT was no longer available to some market participants. Because of the futures discount, those market professionals who could sell stocks did so. At the same time, the huge discount at which futures were selling made stocks look expensive and stifled buying demand in the stock market. The stock market drafted down in the wake of the futures market. The result was sell-side order imbalances in both markets, leading to the near disintegration of market pricing. Closing the futures market had a number of marked effects on the equity market. On the sell side, it disconnected most of the portfolio insurers from the market. On the buy side, there was no longer a cheap futures alternative to buying stocks. Finally, the negative psychology of the billboard effect was eliminated. The reaction of the stock market was dramatic. The Dow rallied 125 points in the next 45 minutes. When the futures market reopened, just after 1 p.m., it was still at a substantial 17-point discount to stocks. Many of the effects which had rallied the stock market were reversed. Portfolio insurers resumed selling futures, and the stock market began drafting down again. The Dow lost almost 100 points in the next half hour. By early Tuesday afternoon, the equity market was again in free fall and needed reassurance. This came from a series of announced stock buyback programs by major corporations. By committing to these programs, the corporations provided needed support for the future level of their stocks. The buying power represented by these announced programs would ultimately total over $6 billion by Tuesday evening. Around 2 p.m., the combined effect of buybacks already announced and those expected turned the equity market around. The Dow rallied 170 points between 2 p.m. and 3.30 p.m. After a decline in the last 30 minutes induced by program sales, the Dow closed with a net gain for the day of over 100 points, the largest gain on record. Although Monday was the day of the dramatic stock market decline, it was midday Tuesday that the securities markets and the financial system approached breakdown. First, the ability of securities markets to price equities was in question. The futures and stock markets were disconnected. There were few buyers in either market, and individual stocks ceased to trade. Investors began to question the value of equity assets. Second, and more serious, a widespread credit breakdown seemed for a period of time quite possible. Amid rumors, subsequently revealed to be unfounded, of financial failures by some clearinghouses and several major market participants, and exacerbated by the fragmentation and complexity of the clearing process, the financial system came close to gridlock. Intermarket transactions required funds transfers and made demands for bank credit almost beyond the capacity of the system to provide. Summary Although the equity market's behavior during the week was complex and rich in detail, several important themes emerge. First, reactive selling by institutions, which followed portfolio insurance strategies and sought to liquidate large fractions of their stock holdings regardless of price, played a prominent role in the market break. By reasonable estimates, the formulas used by portfolio insurers 
dictated the sale of 20 to $30 billion of equities over this short time span. Under such pressure, prices must fall dramatically. Transaction systems, such as DOT, or market stabilizing mechanisms, such as the NYSE specialists, are bound to be crushed by such selling pressure, however they are designed or capitalized. Second, a few mutual funds sold stock in reaction to redemptions. To the market, their behavior looked much like that of the portfolio insurers, that is, selling without primary regard to price. Third, some aggressive trading-oriented investors, seizing the profit opportunity presented by the predictable forced selling by other institutions, contributed to the market break. Fourth, much of the selling pressure was concentrated in the hands of surprisingly few institutions. A handful of large investors provided the impetus for the sharpness of the decline. Fifth, as the figures showing intraday trading patterns make clear, futures and stock market movements were inextricably related. Portfolio insurers sold in the futures market, forcing prices down. The downward price pressure in the futures market was then transmitted to the stock market by index arbitrage and diverted portfolio insurance sales. While index arbitrageurs may not have accounted for a substantial part of total daily volume, they were particularly active during the day at times of substantial price movements. They were not, however, the primary cause of the movements. Rather, they were the transmission mechanism for the pressures initiated by other institutions. Finally, there were periods when the linkage between stock and futures markets became completely disconnected, leading to a freefall in both markets. The juxtaposition of a record 508 point decline on Monday and a record 102 point bounce back on Tuesday suggests that these trading forces outstripped the capacity of market infrastructures. The over-the-counter market and foreign stock markets experienced concurrent declines. The dominant position of NYSE stocks made such a sympathetic reaction predictable. End of Section 4 Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island Section 5 of Report of the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island. Chapter 5. Market Performance. Market performance can be measured against a variety of quantitative and qualitative criteria, including the availability of the market, the liquidity and depth provided by the market makers, the orderliness and fairness of the market, and the strength of the clearing and credit systems that support the market. The events of October 19th and 20th tested the capacity of the equity market to a degree that was not widely anticipated. Availability of Market the most immediately striking fact about the performance of the equity market during the market break is that, in the face of selling pressure of unprecedented severity, it handled a record volume of transactions. The extent to which trading in listed stocks and the S&P 500 futures contract was suspended during the critical days of October 19th and 20th was, in light of the pressures brought to bear, surprisingly limited. On the morning of October 19th, 8% of NYSE issues, or a total of 187 stocks, failed to open for trading at or near 9.30 a.m. By 11.30 a.m., 
41 of these stocks remained unopened, and by noon, all but 25 were trading. During the course of October 19th, trading was halted in seven stocks. On the morning of October 20th, 90 stocks failed to open promptly, and by 11.30 a.m., all but 15 of these were trading. However, during the course of October 20th, trading was halted in 175 stocks, including some of the most actively traded issues on the exchange. The S&P 500 futures market was open throughout the day on Monday and halted trading only between 12.15 p.m. and 1.05 p.m. on Tuesday. While total NASDAQ trading volume increased during the market break, it declined dramatically as a percentage of NYSE volume. From a level of 83% of NYSE volume prior to the break, NASDAQ volume dropped to 37% of NYSE levels on October 19th and 47% on October 20th. The options market had great difficulty trading on both Monday and Tuesday. On October 19th, the S&P 100 option went through two rotations before opening for free trading at 12.36 p.m. On October 20th, the S&P 100 option again required two rotations to open, and the CBOE halted trading for about one and one-half hours. Thus, free trading did not begin until 3.23 p.m., which allowed just 52 minutes of free trading. Thus, all marketplaces, except the options market and, to some extent, the -the over-the-counter market, remained reasonably available for trading on October 19th and October 20th. However, the performance of financial markets cannot be judged solely in terms of volumes traded. The terms on which trades were executed are equally important. Effective market-making mechanisms should sustain fair and orderly trading in several critical respects. At best, market mechanisms should smooth out temporary fluctuations in market prices. At a minimum, they should not exacerbate price fluctuations. Also, trading should be conducted on an equitable basis. Similar orders entered under equal conditions should not be executed on widely different terms. In neither of these respects did market mechanisms perform effectively during the critical days of the October market break. Price behavior. Throughout the week of October 12th to 16th, Market mechanisms for equity-related instruments coped reasonably well with heavy and gradually increasing selling pressure. Even on Friday, October 16th, the major stock markets handled a record volume and a substantial selling imbalance without the kinds of extreme price deviations that occurred on the 19th and 20th. Compared to the events of the 19th and 20th, The stock indices also track their respective futures contracts reasonably. In contrast, the price performance of market mechanisms on the 19th and 20th appears to have been notable, both in terms of history and the immediately surrounding period of time. At critical times, prices of individual stocks, derivative instruments, and the equity market as a whole experienced major fluctuations. This is apparent in the behavior of the major NYSE stock indices during October 19th and 20th. In the final hour of trading on Monday, October 19th, the Dow fell by 220 points, or 11.2%. At the open on Tuesday, October 20, most of these losses were made up as the Dow opened 12.1% higher to just below the levels that had been in effect an hour before the close on Monday. 
By noon on Tuesday, the Dow had dropped back 11.4%, almost exactly to the level of the close on Monday, when the Dow finally stabilized on subsequent trading days between 1,900 and 2,000, it had recovered all of these additional losses. Price fluctuations in the futures market were often more violent. For example, in a period of one hour beginning around 1.30 p.m. on Monday, October 19, the price of an S&P 500 futures contract fell by 12% despite a drop of only 7% in that hour in the S&P 500 index. Similarly, on Tuesday, October 20, price fluctuations in the futures market were often more extreme than those of the underlying stock indices. Thus, the S&P 500 contract which fell about 17% in the final two hours of Monday's trading, opened up 10% on Tuesday and quickly recovered the full 17% loss of the final hours of Monday. At the same time, the S&P 500 index rallied 9%. However, in the next two hours, this entire gain and more disappeared as the S&P 500 futures contract fell by 25% until trading was halted. The index dropped 12% in the same period. After several more gyrations during the week, the futures market finally stabilized in subsequent weeks near the level it had reached before the sharp midday decline on Monday, October 19th. This pattern of large but transitory price changes also characterized trading in individual stocks. For example, two large capitalization NYSE-listed stocks that failed to open on Monday morning until about 10.30 a.m. opened down 17% and 19%. Within the next hour, the Dow moved down 1.4%, and these two stocks rose by 13% and 16% respectively, recovering roughly 80% of their opening losses. On Tuesday morning, four stocks out of a sample of 50 large capitalization stocks studied in detail opened at prices more than 25% higher than at their close on Monday. These openings occurred at various times between 9.50 a.m. and 10.50 a.m., and the four stocks opened up by an average of 27.8%. By 11.30 a.m., their prices had declined an average of 15.1%, from the opening levels, eliminating about 55% of their opening gains. Patterns of sharp movements in individual stocks, which were rapidly reversed, were common on Tuesday, October 20. Based on an examination of the average prices at which NASDAQ stocks traded within 15-minute intervals, The setting of prices by a large number of market makers appears to have smoothed out price trends. However, extreme disparities in prices at which individual trades were executed during these intervals were not uncommon. On Monday, October 19, and Tuesday, October 20, the highest reported price at which particular stocks changed hands was sometimes more than 10% higher than the lowest reported price of those stocks in the same 15-minute interval. In certain instances, price disparities of more than 20% occurred in essentially contemporaneous trades. Price behavior in the S&P 100 options market is more difficult to assess. In contrast to the stock and futures markets, 
which handled volumes well in excess of normal. Volume in the S&P 100 options market was down significantly on October 19 and 20. Also, as noted above, the S&P 100 option did not trade freely for extended periods of time, especially on Tuesday. Nevertheless, prices at which the S&P 100 options did trade exhibited discontinuous jumps. For a typical example, the S&P 100 November 305 put option traded at $66 in the first rotation on Monday and $58 in the second rotation, a 12% difference, with no intervening trades, although the second rotation occurred roughly an hour later. Some prices were also disorderly. For example, on Tuesday, the S&P 100 November 185 put, which should have been substantially less valuable, opened at 11.54 a.m. with a price of $81. In the intervening 13-minute period, the actual level of the S&P 100 index had changed by less than 2%, and the S&P 500 futures contract was unchanged. Equal Access to Trading Opportunities The extreme volatility of market prices on October 19 and 20, subjected all market participants, and particularly small investors, to capriciously different treatment. Price variations as large and erratic as those that occurred on October 19 and 20 can be inherently discriminatory. An investor selling stock or futures contracts near the close on Monday suffered a loss of 10 to 12 percent compared to investors who sold either an hour earlier or the next morning. In contrast, an investor who bought at or near the open on Tuesday morning paid from 10 to 20 percent more than one who bought either at the previous afternoon's close or two hours later. In addition to these discrepancies, small investors were at an apparent disadvantage in speed of order execution. Part of the disadvantage stemmed from an understandable difficulty experienced by small investors in reaching retail brokers, which was widely reported but impossible to quantify after the fact. Another part of the problem was, however, attributable to delays and failures of the automated, small-order-oriented processing systems of both the NYSE and the OTC market. The orders of small investors are generally executed through these systems, and small investors tend to have less access to other means of executing orders than do larger investors. Although the NYSE DOT system was originally designed for small orders, the permitted order size has increased to 30,099 shares for market orders and 99,999 shares for limit orders. Nevertheless, the DOT system remains the most important means of processing small investor orders. On Monday, October 19, orders for 396 million shares were entered into the NYSE's DOT system. This unprecedented traffic at times overwhelmed the mechanical printers that print DOT orders at certain trading posts, resulting in significant delays in executing market orders and in entering limit orders. These delays meant that market orders were executed at prices, often very different from those in effect when the orders were entered. The delays also meant that limit orders may not have been executed because of their limits having been passed by the time the order reached the trading post. 
the SOES, Small Order Execution System, designed to execute trades in the OTC market of 1,000 shares or less, typically handles 12 to 15 percent of trades in OTC stocks traded in the national market system, although less than 2% of share volume. In addition to SOES, some large full-service brokers and wholesalers have comparable proprietary computer systems, which typically execute more than one-half of their orders. On October 19 and 20, Two factors limited execution of trades through the SOES and other automated execution systems. First, some large firms, four of the 50 largest on October 19 and 18 of the 50 largest on October 20, did not participate in the SOES system at all during those days, even though they had previously participated. Other firms withdrew for a portion of those days. Second, automatic protection features designed to protect market makers against potential losses from executing orders where the ask price in the quotation system is not higher than the bid price shut down trading in many stocks on SOES and the proprietary systems during much of the 19th and 20th. On October 19, these systems were incapable, on average, of trading each of the top 50 NASDAQ stocks 43% of the time. On Tuesday, October 20, this figure rose to about 53%. During these shutdown periods, Small orders in some of the proprietary systems backed up and, in some instances, were automatically executed in batches when the systems again began to function. Others were executed even later in the day. These system failures, coupled with natural delays in processing orders at the retail level, meant that small investor orders were executed at random times and, therefore, at prices that varied widely from those in existence when purchase or sale decisions were made. The unequal speed at which trades were executed did not necessarily disadvantage small investors. In some cases, delays in execution, for example, of buy orders, entered prior to the opening on Monday, might have been substantially beneficial to some small investors. However, the existence of unequal access would almost necessarily have created at least an appearance of unfairness. In the futures and options marketplaces, different levels of access to trading have a significantly different impact than in the various stock market places. Non-institutional participants play only a limited role in the S&P 500 stock index futures market, but play a significant role in the S&P 100 options market. The problem of the different treatment of large and small investors in these markets was a consequence of differences in response speeds and access to information. Non-professional participants who lack access to continuous market information expect to have continuous opportunities to withdraw from investments in a timely way. Obviously, on October 19 and 20, these expectations were unfulfilled. In the S&P 100 options market on October 19 and 20, everyone suffered from some inability to trade. Individual participants who wrote put options before October 19 and 20 often found themselves either locked into their positions or involuntarily liquidated during these crucial two days. Individual participants in the futures market may have suffered substantial losses before becoming aware of what had happened, and even normal delays in executing retail orders 
may have exacerbated these losses. Market Maker Performance The active market makers whose performance was analyzed based upon information available to the task force include the NYSE specialists, OTC and options market makers, and the local traders in the futures market who play the analogous market maker role. Data was not available to enable the task force to analyze the performance of NYSE block traders, who also play an important market making role. New York Stock Exchange Specialists The performance of NYSE specialists during the October market break period varied over time and from specialist to specialist. From October 14 through October 16, while the Dow was falling by 10.6%, specialists, on balance, purchased approximately $286 million in stock. On October 19, specialists as a whole purchased just under $486 million worth of stock. During the first hour and one half on October 19, specialists bought heavily in the face of unprecedented selling pressure. At this critical time, specialists were willing to lean against the dominant downward trend in the market at a significant cost to themselves. Also, in the price collapse which characterized the final hour of trading on October 19, most specialists, again, appear to have been net purchasers of stock, although their participation at this time was significantly less extensive in the face of a greater price decline than their intervention at the October 19 opening. These figures, however, conceal marked differences in behavior among specialists. Fully 30% of specialists in a sample of 50 large capitalization stocks, were net sellers of those stocks on October 19. Further, 10% of specialists in that sample finished the day with net short positions in those stocks. Finally, about 10% of the openings on October 19 that were down sharply from the closing prices on October 16 were followed by sharp rebounds that eliminated much of those initial losses. On October 20, roughly one-third of the specialists in the 50-stock sample set opening prices which were substantially higher than closing prices on October 19, and which declined rapidly to levels at or near their October 19 closes. These apparent misjudgments of opening prices may have aggravated an already uncertain atmosphere on Tuesday, October 20. On the whole, specialists sold over $450 million in stock, and in the sample of 50 large capitalization stocks, fully 82% of the specialists were net sellers on October 20. An examination was made of the 31 stocks for which detailed trade data for October 19 and 20 were available. These stocks were classified into three groups, those for which specialists purchased stock in a way that generally tended to counterbalance market trends and smooth price fluctuations, even if they were not always successful. Those for which specialists acted in a way that generally reinforced market trends, and those for which specialists took only limited net positions. This classification was done by the task force and differs from the tests used by the NYSE to evaluate specialist performance. The results of this examination are as follows. The limited nature of some specialists' contributions to price stability may have been due to the exhaustion of their purchasing power following attempts 
to stabilize markets at the open on October 19. However, for other specialists, lack of purchasing power appears not to have been the determining factor in their behavior. It is understandable that specialists would not sacrifice large amounts of capital in what must have seemed a hopeless attempt to stem overwhelming waves of selling pressure. Nevertheless, from the final hours of trading on October 19 through October 20, a substantial number of NYSE specialists appear not to have been a significant force in counterbalancing market trends. OTC Market Makers Unlike shares on the NYSE, each NASDAQ stock is served by a number of market makers, none of which has either an express or implied commitment to maintain an orderly market. Under these conditions, it is difficult to relate the performance of this market as a whole to the performance of individual market makers. During the week of October 19, some market makers formally withdrew from making markets. In addition, some market makers ceased performing their function, merely by not answering their telephones during this period. However, it is impossible, on the basis of information available to the task force, to assess the extent and impact of this form of non-participation. Other market makers who were willing to trade were unreachable when they were overwhelmed by the volume of telephone orders, many of which normally would have been executed by the automated systems. There were also widespread reports that many market makers, who normally stand ready to buy and sell hundreds and sometimes thousands of shares at their quoted prices, were only willing to fulfill their minimum obligation by buying and selling 100 shares at the quoted price. Another indication of deterioration in market-making performance is the withdrawal by some market makers from the SOES system, thus reducing from 1,000 to 100 the number of shares they were obligated to buy or sell. In addition, bid-offer spreads also widened during this period. For example, on October 20, the larger NASDAQ securities, for which real-time quotations are disseminated, had quoted spreads of one-eighth, one-fourth, or three-eighths only 32.6% of the time, compared to such quoted spreads 42.8% of the time during the three weeks ending October 16. Locals in the Futures Market Locals in the Futures Market, who, like OTC traders, have no formal commitment to stabilize prices, were, as a group, somewhat more aggressive than normal in taking net positions on October 19. During the three-day market decline from Wednesday, October 14, to Friday, October 16, gross purchases by locals averaged about 48,000 contracts per day, or about 46% of total volume. The best available data indicates that locals were net sellers on October 14, and small net buyers on the subsequent two days. Over the three-day decline, Local net buys were 235 contracts worth about $34 million or less than one-tenth of one percent of total volume. Thus, locals did not help offset the market decline during those days. On Monday, October 19, locals purchased 48,487 contracts or 31.4% of total volume. Net buys were 1,743 contracts, worth $221 million, representing about 1% of total volume. These net buys were generally concentrated in time periods 
when prices were falling. Only after 2.30 p.m. did locals not enter the market as net buyers during periods of declining prices. Moreover, like the stock market, the willingness of locals to lean against prevailing price trends was largely exhausted by the middle of the afternoon on October 19. From 2.30 p.m. to the close of business on October 20, gross local buys amounted to 35,325 contracts, or 24.1% of total volume. Net buys were a negative 530 contracts worth $59 million. In sum, while the locals, as a group, absorbed some selling pressure, they did not act uniformly and were not able to counterbalance the public selling pressure. Since the locals do not and have no responsibility to absorb significant imbalances in order flow, the futures market functions as an efficient risk transfer mechanism only when the activity of locals is supplemented by market participants, such as speculators and index arbitrageurs. This is especially true with respect to imbalances of the magnitude exhibited during the October market break. Options Market Makers The structure of the options marketplace is more important to an assessment of the performance of the options marketplace than is the performance of the options market makers. Options market makers were constrained from maintaining a stable orderly market because options are inherently susceptible to the largest percentage price changes of all equity products. Reliable data about underlying indices was not always available. The exchanges failed to add new strike prices in a timely fashion. Extraordinary demands for additional margin were made, even on market makers with hedged positions, and the truncated periods of free trading may have justifiably affected the willingness of market makers to establish positions that they were unsure of being able to liquidate readily. Although the lack of free trading inhibited reasonable price continuity on October 19 and 20, the bid-ask spread in the S&P 100 market shifted frequently, but generally remained reasonable during periods of free trading. However, there were numerous price disparities in the options market. On the whole, options market makers did not play an important role in stabilizing their own market and, through their hedging activities, may have marginally added to the pressure in other markets. Clearing and Credit Difficulties with the clearing and credit systems further exacerbated the difficulties of market makers and other market participants during the market break. Because of the five-day settlement rule for stocks, these concerns were less immediate in the stock markets than in the futures and options markets, where settlement is made the next day. However, in the stock market, the unprecedented volume led to an unusually large number of questioned trades. Questioned trades affected 67,673 NYSE trades on October 19 and 62,564 NYSE trades on October 20. That represented 4.02% and 4.25% of transaction sides on those two days, respectively. As a percentage of transaction sides, these latter figures were 202 and 220% above normal, respectively. Uncertainties concerning the ultimate disposition 
of questioned trades added to other uncertainties regarding the financial condition of specialists and other broker-dealers on October 19 and 20. Settlement problems in the futures and options markets also contributed to these uncertainties. During the day of October 19, the CME Clearinghouse, which is responsible for setting margins on futures contracts, responded to the sharp price decline by making intraday variation margin calls for $1.6 billion cash and cash equivalents. Covering these margin calls were paid in by losing clearinghouse members during the day. According to clearinghouse rules, these funds were not paid out to the winners until the next day. In addition, variation margin calls, which had been made on Monday morning to cover settlements of Friday's closing positions, were unusually high. Total variation margin calls on Monday morning and during the day on Monday were $2 billion. At the same time, OCC members also faced substantial morning and intraday margin calls to cover the deterioration in the positions of put options sellers, both proprietary and customer. On October 19, the OCC issued four intraday margin calls that collected $1 billion from clearinghouse members. In many cases, the OCC clearing members, such as large investment banks, also belong to the CME. Like the CME clearinghouse, the OCC does not pay out excess margin funds on an intraday basis. Thus, OCC and CME clearing members were required to deposit $3 billion on Monday, October 19. Some of these deposits were to cover options losses that were offset by futures profits, which resulted in further strains on liquidity. After giving credit for Monday's intraday margin calls, Tuesday morning margin calls for Monday's trading activity were $2.1 billion for the CME clearinghouse and $0.9 billion for the OCC. Because clearinghouse members are required to meet these calls even before any compensating deposits are received either from customers or clearinghouses, the clearing members were compelled to increase their reliance on intraday credit from their commercial bankers. However, the bankers in question were already concerned about potential losses that their clearing member customers might have suffered in other lines of activity, such as risk arbitrage, block trading, or foreign exchange trading. Bankers were also concerned that the clearinghouses would be unable to collect all their margin calls and would be unable to pay in full the balances owed to their clearinghouse members. These concerns apparently resulted in the withdrawal of uncommitted lines of credit to some market participants, restrictions on new loans to some clearinghouse members, and a general concern on the part of bankers overextending credit to cover Tuesday morning margin calls. In this atmosphere of uncertainty, the more possibility that commercial banks might curtail lending to clearinghouse members was enough to raise questions and feed rumors about the viability of those firms and the clearinghouses. However, timely intervention by the Federal Reserve helped assure a continuing supply of credit to the clearinghouse members. At 8.15 a.m. on Tuesday morning, it was announced that 
quote, the Federal Reserve Bank affirms its readiness to serve as a source of liquidity to support the economic and financial system, end quote. Notwithstanding these assurances, there were continued difficulties on Tuesday. For example, because of delays in the CME clearing process, two major clearinghouse members with margin collections of $1.5 billion due them on Tuesday did not receive their funds until after 3 p.m many hours later than normal. Meanwhile, these clearinghouse members had already credited customers with balances from their profitable trades, and, in many cases, the customers had already withdrawn these balances from the clearinghouse members. OCC's clearing process was also delayed on Tuesday, and one of its major clearing members required an immediate capital infusion to meet margin calls. Although the cash credit and the timing demands of the current clearinghouse system raised the possibility of a default, none occurred. On the other hand, the mere possibility that a clearinghouse might default or that liquidity would disappear contributed to volatility on Tuesday in two important ways. First, some market makers did curtail their market-making activities, especially in the case of block trading, where temporary commitments of capital were required because they feared that loans or credit lines from their commercial bankers might be exhausted or withdrawn. Second, uncertainties about the activities and viability of the clearinghouses, as well as major broker-dealers, appear to have increased investor uncertainty in the already turbulent atmosphere of October 20. These uncertainties intensified market fluctuations, and the sense of panic evident that day. Had decisive action not been taken by the Federal Reserve, it appears that far worse consequences would have been a very real possibility. Summary The degree to which existing market mechanisms can be held responsible for what occurred during the October break depends upon the standards by which these mechanisms are measured. Ideally, the full transition from a Dow level of 2,500 on Wednesday, October 14, to a range between 1,900 and 2,000, where equity markets settled in late 1987, should have occurred in a rational way, without sharp transitory declines or rises. From October 14 to 16, price movements, trading activity, and market maker performance were generally consistent with any reasonable notion of orderly markets, despite a decline of about 7% in the major market indices. However, as the rate of decline accelerated on November 19, the efficiency with which the equity market functioned deteriorated markedly. By the late afternoon of October 19, market makers on the major stock exchanges appear to have largely abandoned serious attempts to stem the downward movement in prices. In the futures and options markets, market makers were not a significant factor during that time. Price changes and trading activity were highly erratic from late Monday afternoon through most of the day on Tuesday, October 20, as market makers were overwhelmed by selling. Realistically, in the face of October's violent shifts in selling demand for equity-related securities, a rational downward transition in stock prices was not possible. Market makers possessed neither the resources nor the willingness to absorb the extraordinary volume of selling demand that materialized. Even under conceivable alternative arrangements, market makers would still face limited incentives and resources 
to manage an absolutely smooth transition in the face of the kind of demand fluctuations which confronted them on October 19 and 20. The violence of the market movements, both upward and downward, threatened to undermine the integrity of the markets and may have substantially inhibited buyers' participation. At the same time, these market shifts created uncertainty about the solvency of major market-making institutions, both directly and through the impact of these rapid price changes on the clearing and settlement systems of the futures and options markets. These factors in turn threatened the availability of credit to market makers, which could have forced them, at a minimum, to curtail their market-making activities and, at worst, to fail. By midday Tuesday, October 20, it appeared possible that a continuing steep decline could have reduced the capital of certain market makers to a level at which they could not obtain sufficient additional funds to continue their participation in the markets. At that point, the major exchanges might have decided to halt trading. The consequences of such a sequence of events, even without a failure of a major broker-dealer or a clearinghouse, could have been severe. Yet, at one point, on October 20, such an outcome appeared to be conceivable. End of Section 5 Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island Section 6 of the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island. Chapter 6. One Market. Stocks, Stock Index Futures, and Stock Options. Analysis of market behavior during the crucial days in mid-October makes clear an important conclusion. From an economic viewpoint, what have been traditionally seen as separate markets, the markets for stocks, stock index futures, and stock options, are in fact one market. Under ordinary circumstances, these marketplaces move sympathetically, linked by a number of forces. The pathology which resulted when the linkages among these market segments failed underlay the market break of October. Many mechanisms link these marketplaces. The instruments, stocks, stock index futures, and stock options are fundamentally driven by the same economic forces. The same major investment banks dominate the trading among all three segments, both in executing orders for others and for their own accounts. In addition, Many of the same institutions are responsible for a large amount of the trading in all three instruments, and particularly in stocks and index futures. Many of the trading strategies discussed in this report also serve to link these marketplaces. Index arbitrage provides a direct linkage between the stock and index futures markets. Faced with increasingly chaotic markets in October, portfolio insurers, to the extent possible, abandoned the, their reliance on the futures markets to execute their strategies and switched to selling stocks directly, underlining the commonality among market functioning. Another link is the routine use of the futures markets by institutions investing in index funds as a fast and low-cost entry and exit vehicle to the stock market. And, of course, a host of hedging strategies for individual stock positions employ counterbalancing purchases and sales by market makers in these marketplaces. Market makers in these markets routinely hedge their positions by trading in two markets. For example, Market makers in the S&P 100 option hedge by using the S&P 500 futures contract, and some NYSE specialists also hedge their market-making activities 
with futures contracts. Specialists and market makers in futures and options constantly monitor up-to-the-minute prices in other markets on electronic screens. Market makers tend to carry minimal positions from day to day, providing liquidity for normal market moves, but not for the kind of abnormally large swings experienced in October 1987. Clearing procedures in the several market segments produce further intertwining. While it is not yet possible to cross-margin positions, proceeds from sales in one market segment may provide funds needed to pay for purchases in another. Fears that a clearinghouse in one market segment might be unable to deliver funds owed to investors can ignite concern throughout the system as it did in October. In sum, what may appear superficially to be three separate markets for stocks, stock options, and stock index futures, in fact behaves as one market. As the data in Chapter 4 makes clear, the market's break was exacerbated by the failure of institutions employing portfolio insurance strategies to understand that the markets in which the various instruments trade are economically linked into one equity market. Portfolio insurance theory assumes that it would be infeasible to sell huge volumes of stock on the exchange in short periods of time with only a small price impact. These institutions came to believe that the futures market offered a separate haven of liquidity sufficient to allow them to liquidate huge positions over short periods of time with minimal price displacement. In October, this belief proved to be unrealistic. The futures market simply could not absorb such selling pressure without dramatic price declines. Moreover, reflecting the natural linkages among markets, the selling pressure washed across to the stock market, both through index arbitrage and direct portfolio insurance stock sales. Large amounts of selling and the demand for liquidity associated with it cannot be contained in a single market segment. It necessarily overflows into the other market segments, which are naturally linked. There are, however, natural limits to intermarket liquidity, which were made evident on October 19 and 20. Just as the failure of sellers to understand that they were trading in a single equity market exacerbated the market break, so too did the breakdown of certain structural mechanisms linking these separate market segments. Unopened stocks inhibited trading in the derivative instruments. The CME's temporary closing and the difficulties the CBOE had in opening options trading interfered with intermarket transactions. Transaction delays through the NYSE's DOT system and the subsequent decision to prohibit proprietary index arbitrage through the system also disconnected the market segments. Under normal circumstances, index arbitrage acts as one of the primary bridges between stock and futures markets. By midday, October 19, this arbitrage became difficult. First, transactions backed up in the DOT system, and then, on subsequent days, access to the system was denied to these traders. However, had the system functioned more effectively, this linkage would have been incapable of transmitting the full weight of the estimated $25 billion of selling dictated by portfolio insurance strategies. Even as direct arbitrage between stocks and futures failed, portfolio insurers provided some indirect arbitrage when they switched from selling futures to selling stocks. 
The amount of such indirect arbitrage was limited by, among other things, structural and regulatory rigidities. Many insurers were authorized to sell only futures, not stocks, for their clients, and so they continued to sell futures despite the large discount which confronted them. Many institutional stock investors are not authorized to purchase futures contracts, and therefore they could not supply buying support to the market despite the discount. Differences in margin and clearinghouse mechanisms contributed further to the failure of linkages within the single equity market. Many investors, not fully understanding margin and clearing mechanisms in futures, responded to rumors of payment failures and the reality of late payments by the CME Clearinghouse by refusing to buy in the futures market. The decisions of lenders were also influenced by concerns over inconsistencies among the several markets. The complexity of clearing massive volumes of stocks, options, and futures through separate clearinghouses caused some lenders to hesitate in extending credit. The consequent threat of financial gridlock posed the prospect of major financial system breakdown on October 20, prompting the Federal Reserve to boost investor confidence by promising to inject liquidity into the market. A number of factors ultimately contributed to the failure of the stock and futures markets to function as one market. As the markets became disengaged, a near freefall developed in both markets. Sellers put direct downward pressure on both markets. As large discounts developed between futures and stocks, those investors who could switched from selling futures to selling stocks. Those unable to switch continued to sell futures, driving these prices down further. Stock investors not authorized to purchase futures or fearful of buying them provided no offsetting buying support in the futures market. The enormous futures discounts signaled to prospective stock buyers that further declines were imminent. At one point on October 20, for example, the stock index futures price was forecasting a Dow of 1,400. This billboard effect inhibited some stock purchases. Moreover, the futures discount made stocks appear expensive, inhibiting buying support for the market. The pathology of disconnected markets fed on itself. Faced with a surfeit of sellers and a scarcity of buyers, both markets, futures and stock, were at times on October 19 and 20 nearly in freefall. The ability of the equity market to absorb the huge selling pressure to which it was subjected in mid-October depends on its liquidity. During periods of normal volume, the liquidity provided by market makers and specialists in the separate market segments is sufficient. When abnormal demands confront the equity market, the liquidity in each marketplace is unimportant. Specialists in the stock market and market makers in the futures market go home at the end of each day with, at most, relatively small positions. Investors must depend on the liquidity supplied by participants in the entire equity market. The ability to sell futures is linked to stock market liquidity and vice versa. The liquidity apparent during periods of normal volume provided by the activities of market makers and active traders on both sides of the market is something of an illusion. Liquidity sufficient to absorb the selling demands of a limited number of investors becomes an illusion of liquidity when confronted by massive selling as everyone shows up on the same side of the market at once.
as with people in a theater when someone yells fire. These cellars all ran for the exit in October, but it was large enough to accommodate only a few. For these sellers, it takes time to find buyers on the other side of the market. Potential buyers, such as value investors, do not operate by formula and must have adequate time to assemble data and make evaluations before they will commit to buy. Certain important conclusions should be drawn from the behavior of the markets for stocks, stock index futures, and options in mid-October. First and foremost, these apparently separate markets are, in an economic sense, one market. They are linked by instruments, participants, trading strategies, and clearing flows. Nonetheless, institutional and regulatory structures interfere with the linkages among them and hinder their smooth and efficient operation. The illusion of liquidity in the futures, options, and stock markets contrasts with the reality of the overall equity market's liquidity. The finite capacity of this single, inextricably fused system of markets to absorb major selling or buying demands. Ironically, it was this illusion of liquidity which led some similarly motivated investors, such as portfolio insurers, to adopt strategies which call for liquidity far in excess of what the market could supply. A number of failures of the one market system contributed to the violent break of the separate market segments in October and pushed the country to the brink of the financial system's limits. It is not possible to prevent investors from being misinformed about the capabilities of markets or to prevent markets from adjusting to the demands put upon them. But it is only prudent to design mechanisms to protect investors, the market's infrastructures, the financial system, and the economy from the destructive consequence of violent market breaks. End of Section 6 Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island Section 7 of The Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island Chapter 7 Regulatory Implications Stocks, stock index futures, and stock options constitute one market, mandating a regulatory structure designed to be consistent with this economic reality. The failure of these market segments to perform as one market contributed to the violence of the market break in October 1987, which brought the financial system near to a breakdown. To a large extent, the failure was rooted in institutional and regulatory rigidities as well as misconceptions of market participants. That this crisis was precipitated to a large extent by the activity of a few active institutions illustrates the vulnerability of the financial system and the need for remedial action. This failure is amenable to reform. To prevent future damage, this inextricably interrelated system of markets needs to work smoothly and in harmony. The growth of intermarket trading activities is a phenomenon of the 1980s. The October 1987 experience illustrates that regulatory changes derived from the one market concept are necessary both to reduce the possibility of destructive market breaks and to deal effectively with such episodes should they occur. The guiding objective should be to enhance the integrity and competitiveness of U.S. financial markets. One market mandates one agency for intermarket issues. 
The analysis of the October market break demonstrates that one agency must have the authority to coordinate a few but critical intermarket regulatory issues, monitor intermarket activities, and mediate intermarket concerns. This intermarket, across markets, agency need not take responsibility for all intramarket, within one market, regulatory issues. Such matters as securities registration, tender offer rules, and regulation of stock and option trading practices should be left to the SEC, which has the required expertise in these areas. Intramarket issues in futures markets should remain within the purview of the CFTC, which has expertise in the design and regulation of futures contracts and markets. However, there are a few important intermarket regulatory issues which must be considered jointly and simultaneously across market segments to ensure that intermarket systems operate harmoniously. These are issues which cannot be decided from the perspective of a single marketplace. Doing so imposes pervasive, unavoidable, and possibly destabilizing influences on other related marketplaces and on the interrelated market system as a whole. Intermarket reform raises two fundamental questions. Who should have the responsibility for intermarket coordination? What are the few crucial intermarket issues which must be assigned to the intermarket agency? The choice of the agency follows from the requirements of the intermarket task. The October experience demonstrates that the issues which have an impact across related markets and throughout the financial system include clearing and credit mechanisms, margin requirements, circuit breaker mechanisms such as price limits and trading halts, and information systems for monitoring intermarket activities. It is important to recognize that this approach does not involve imposing substantial new regulatory burdens. For the most part, it involves the reallocation of existing regulatory tasks in a manner designed to conform to the fundamental economic reality that stocks, stock index futures, and options are one market. The Intermarket Agency The October episode gives a clear view of the characteristics and expertise required to coordinate intermarket issues relating to stocks, stock index futures, and options. The most fundamental requirement is broad and deep expertise in these market segments and instruments. However, expertise in individual instruments and market segments is not sufficient. The key requirement is expertise in the interaction of instruments and marketplaces as an integrated system. Moreover, the October break illustrates that difficulties in stocks and derivative market segments produce dislocations in other financial markets. These, in turn, exacerbate the problem in stocks and derivative market segments. The market break profoundly affected bond and foreign exchange markets, as well as the extension of credit by the banking system. Indeed, the confidence and liquidity of the entire financial system were at risk in October. In addition, global markets were involved. The precipitous decline in the U.S. market was accompanied by a concurrent break in equity markets around the world. Cross-listing of stocks and cross-border investment have strengthened the linkages among global equity markets. During the October break, U.S. market participants were sellers of foreign stocks and U.S. stocks listed on foreign markets. 
specialized transactions in U.S. securities and stock index futures were executed in London. United States bond futures markets in London were influenced by the Federal Reserve's injection of liquidity, as were foreign exchange markets. In short, the October market break had ramifications in a wide variety of global financial markets. Expertise in individual market segments is therefore not sufficient for effective response to intermarket crises. The October experience demonstrates that the intermarket agency must consider the interactions among a wide variety of markets encompassing stocks, stock index futures, stock options, bonds, foreign exchange, and the credit and banking system in both domestic and foreign markets. The critical requirement for the intermarket agency is broad expertise in the financial system as a whole because the greatest potential risk of intermarket failure is to the financial system as a whole, rather than to individual market segments. Financial system expertise is required to deal with a financial system crisis. This expertise is also critical for monitoring and responding to intermarket problems and thus avoiding a financial crisis. In addition, this intermarket agency needs to serve a broad constituency. Since intermarket activities affect the health of the financial system, this constituency is not dominated by the active market participants so prominent in the October episode, nor is the constituency limited to individual investors, the majority owners of U.S. equities. The intermarket agency serves the broader constituency of all those who have a stake in the financial system. Because of its broad constituency, this agency needs the independence to resist demands of partisan political and economic interests, particularly those of active market participants. The stakes are simply too high, the potential adverse consequences of market failure too pervasive. Independence must be balanced by responsiveness. The intermarket agency must respond to evolving needs of financial market participants. Competitive financial markets are a valuable national asset, and the competition for their services is worldwide. Intermarket coordination must be sufficiently flexible to accommodate the innovation in instruments and markets necessary to maintain and strengthen the competitiveness of U.S. financial markets. Therefore, an analysis of the October experience demonstrates the need for one regulatory body with responsibility for rationalizing intermarket issues. The task requires broad expertise in the interaction of domestic and global financial markets, financial strength, prestige, independence, and responsiveness. The task force compared these requirements with alternative regulatory structures, self-regulatory organizations. Self-regulatory organizations, SROs, such as securities and commodities exchanges, are uniquely qualified to regulate intramarket activities. Since they are closest to the action, SROs have the best view of the regulatory needs of their individual market segments. Furthermore, they are motivated by self-interest to preserve the integrity of their marketplace. Nonetheless, SROs are not well suited for intermarket tasks. They lack the authority to coordinate issues across markets and the resources to deal with intermarket issues. Finally, it is not apparent that they possess either the expertise or the incentive to represent the broader constituencies 
within the domestic and global financial system. The Securities and Exchange Commission Centralizing Responsibility for Stocks, Stock Index Futures, and Options within the SEC is attractive on several grounds. The SEC has responsibility for regulating stocks and stock options. Thus, it might seem logical to assign the SEC the responsibility for stocks and all derivative instruments. Moreover, the SEC is structured as an independent agency and has the prestige and influence required for effective regulation. There are drawbacks to this solution to intermarket regulation. Extending SEC authority to stock index futures might require an investment in expertise necessary to regulate complex instruments new to its regulatory purview. This was necessary for the SEC's regulation of stock options. The expertise needed to regulate stock index futures could be acquired by transferring personnel from the CFTC. Doing so might deplete the CFTC's resources and interfere with its capacity to carry out its other regulatory duties. Moreover, the SEC's experience and expertise is focused primarily on regulating intramarket activities, not on rationalizing the interactions among markets. To be effective as an intermarket regulator, the SEC might have to fund the acquisition of expertise in a wide variety of financial markets in the credit and banking system and in international markets. Joint SEC-CFTC Responsibility A single regulator created through joint SEC-CFTC responsibility could be achieved through a merger of the two agencies, a formal joint committee arrangement, or strict requirements for coordination of intermarket regulatory issues. This alternative would bring together the expertise of the SEC and CFTC with respect to specific types of instruments and intra-market regulatory issues. Nonetheless, combining two agencies with intra-market expertise in their respective market segments would not necessarily produce effective intermarket regulation. This alternative might not provide the broad financial system expertise needed to oversee the interaction of domestic and global markets, as well as the banking system. Finally, the need for coordinating the few critical intermarket issues does not diminish the importance of detailed supervision of the much wider range of intramarket activities. The addition of intermarket responsibility risks draining resources from the important regulatory tasks that the SEC and CFTC must administer within their respective market segments. Joint Federal Reserve SEC CFTC Committee the addition of the Federal Reserve would supplement the intra-market expertise of the SEC and CFTC with the broad financial system expertise of the Federal Reserve. Although this alternative has attractive aspects, there are drawbacks. The committee's effectiveness depends upon resisting the intra-market perspective and constituencies of committee representatives. Moreover, the most important objective of intermarket regulation is to avoid an intermarket crisis. This requires clear responsibility for ongoing monitoring of intermarket activities and clear authority to act to avoid a crisis. A joint agency committee may not be well suited for this task. Within a joint agency committee, 
responsibility and authority could become diffuse. In times of crisis, a committee structure would prove cumbersome when immediate action would be imperative. Although there are relatively few intermarket issues to be coordinated, the health of the financial system depends upon effective intermarket regulation. This argues for investing the responsibility in a single responsive agency with the authority to act promptly, rather than assembling a committee representing several agencies. The Federal Reserve In most countries, the central bank, as part of its broader responsibility for the health of a nation's financial system, is the intermarket regulator. The Federal Reserve has a primary responsibility for the health of the U.S. financial system. The Federal Reserve works closely with the Department of the Treasury to achieve this goal. This responsibility and the Federal Reserve's accumulated expertise in discharging this responsibility are arguments in its favor as the appropriate intermarket agency. The intermarket crisis in October ultimately required the Federal Reserve to step in to inject liquidity and boost confidence. This rescue imposed costs and constraints on other economic policy objectives. Since intermarket failure and damage to the financial system ultimately fall upon the Federal Reserve, it could be argued that the Federal Reserve should possess the authority to prevent such an intermarket crisis. Further, in a crisis, the liquidity of the financial system in general, and the banking system in particular, is affected. This is the Federal Reserve's central area of expertise. The Federal Reserve, with its view of money flows, is experienced in assessing interactions and imbalances among marketplaces, as opposed to intramarket concerns. It has experience in international financial market coordination. The importance of these attributes is illustrated by the October break, which involved not only stocks, futures, and options, but bonds, foreign exchange, and international markets. The Federal Reserve also possesses the other characteristics required of an effective intermarket agency. It has the ability standing and influence to establish and coordinate consistent intermarket requirements and to inspire intermarket confidence. Finally, there are precedents for the Federal Reserve as an intermarket agency. The Federal Reserve already has formal responsibility for margin requirements on stocks and stock options. Adding futures margins to the Federal Reserve's purview would be a logical extension of its current responsibilities and is not a major change. Also, the Federal Reserve regulates bank lending to securities market participants. Despite these advantages, there are drawbacks to the Federal Reserve as the intermarket agency. Intermarket coordination would be a new responsibility involving the burden of additional tasks. The Federal Reserve might need to build expertise in intramarket issues in order to carry out its intermarket oversight. Another problem with the Federal Reserve as the intermarket agency is the danger that market participants may take on more risk in the expectation that the Federal Reserve will bail them out in a crisis. Intermarket responsibility could give the Federal Reserve a role to play before financial system crises develop. However, it would still have no requirement to guarantee the actions of any particular firm. 
Balancing the advantage of independence is the need for responsiveness. Of all the major regulatory agencies, the Federal Reserve is perhaps the most independent. Therein lies the potential for a lack of responsiveness to legitimate needs for financial market evolution and innovation. If unresponsive, the Federal Reserve could impair the competitiveness of U.S. financial markets. The Department of the Treasury The Treasury Department possesses most of the advantages of the Federal Reserve. It has broad financial system perspective and expertise, international standing in a variety of markets, financial strength, prestige, and influence. However, unlike the Federal Reserve, the SEC and the CFTC, which are structured as independent agencies, the Treasury is part of the executive branch. Because the Secretary of the Treasury and the Treasury staff serve at the pleasure of the President, it has less independence as a regulatory agency. A New Regulatory Body It would be possible to establish a new regulatory body designed to coordinate intermarket issues. This alternative appears to be more expensive than and inferior to harnessing the accumulated expertise and standing of an existing agency. Guided by the October experience, an analysis of the requirements for effective intermarket coordination demonstrates that expertise in the interaction of markets is the critical requirement. This does not require major restructuring of intramarket regulatory responsibilities. Instead, a few important intermarket issues need to be coordinated by one agency possessing intermarket perspective and expertise. Intermarket Issues Intermarket issues are those which systematically and unavoidably impose influences on all markets. The few important intermarket issues which need to be harmonized by a single body include clearing and credit mechanisms, margin requirements, circuit breaker mechanisms such as price limits and trading halts, and information systems for monitoring intermarket activities. These issues are not the separate concern of individual market segments. The October break illustrates that decisions in one marketplace profoundly affect other marketplaces and the financial system as a whole. Clearing and Credit Mechanisms Clearing and credit mechanisms need to be unified. With separate clearing houses for each market segment, no single clearing corporation has an overview of the intermarket positions of market participants. No clearing house is able to assess accurately intermarket exposure among its clearing members and among their customers. Separate clearing also hampers lenders in assessing the risk exposure of market participants and interferes with collateralization of intermarket positions. In the current system, margin flows are based on intramarket positions and the timing of margin flows differs across clearing houses. For the sort of intermarket transactions which are the mainstay of these markets, funds must be shuttled from clearinghouse to clearinghouse in the margin settlement process. This process creates imbalances in financing needs and increases demand for bank credit. The complexity and fragmentation of the separate clearing mechanisms in stocks, futures, and options, in conjunction with massive volume, violent price volatility, and staggering demands on bank credit, brought the financial system to the brink on Tuesday, October 20. Some clearinghouses were late in making payments. 
there were rumors concerning the viability of clearinghouses and market participants. This, in turn, affected the willingness of lenders to finance market participants under the uncommitted lending arrangements common in the industry. This crisis of confidence raised the specter of a full-scale financial system breakdown and required the Federal Reserve to provide liquidity and confidence. The complexity of the clearing and credit mechanisms, rather than a substantive problem of solvency, was at fault. What is needed is unified clearing with stocks, stock index futures, and stock options, all cleared through a single mechanism. Unified clearing facilitates the smooth settlement of intermarket transactions, which is the linchpin of these markets. It clarifies the credit risk of lending to participants engaged in intermarket transactions. This would reduce the chance of financial gridlock and the attendant risk to the financial system. Margin Requirements Since stocks Stock index futures and stock options compose, in an economic sense, one market, margins need to be rationalized across markets. While margins on stocks and options are already within the Federal Reserve's regulatory purview, futures margins are currently determined by futures exchanges and thus are not subject to intermarket oversight. Futures margins should be consistent with effective stock margins for professional market participants, such as broker-dealers, and cross-margining should be implemented. Margins have two fundamental characteristics. First, margin requirements affect intramarket performance risk. Margins serve as a performance bond to secure the ability of market participants to meet their obligations. Second, margins represent collateral. Thus, margin requirements control the leverage possible in the investment in any financial instrument. On the first point, the intramarket financial performance control aspect of margin requirements, the concept of margins on futures differs fundamentally from that of margins on stock investments. The daily process of marking to market the value of investments in which futures losers must advance margin to pay futures winners differs fundamentally from the stock market margin process of advancing payments against a lending formula. Despite low margin requirements, the financial performance control aspect of futures margins has operated in a sound and effective manner on an intramarket basis. However, margins are more than a financial performance control mechanism. All margin requirements have one aspect in common. Margins are collateral and control the effective economic leverage achievable in any financial instrument. Because margins on futures are lower than those on stocks, market participants can achieve much greater leverage by investing through futures. With a given initial investment, a market participant can control a much greater equity investment indirectly through futures than through a direct investment in stocks. The differing level of financial leverage inherent in differing margin requirements warrants concern for two reasons. First, constraints on leverage control the volume of speculative investment activity. Second, Leverage translates into financial risk, which extends beyond the performance obligation of a specific transaction and a specific marketplace. It has been long recognized that margin requirements through leverage affect the volume of speculative activity. 
controlling speculative behavior is one approach to inhibiting overvaluation in stocks and reducing the potential for a precipitate price decline fueled by the involuntary selling that stems, for example, from margin calls. The equity action achievable with low margin investment in futures has the potential to increase intermarket leverage for market participants. The resulting financial risk may affect their ability to meet obligations in other market segments. Because of the potentially wide-ranging consequences, the level of leverage within the financial system is a legitimate intermarket concern rather than the narrow concern of a particular market segment. The October experience illustrates how a relatively few aggressive professional market participants can produce dramatic swings in market prices. Moreover, the mid-October episode demonstrates that such pressures are transmitted from one marketplace to marketplace, and, at times, pressures concentrated in one market segment can have traumatic effects on the whole system. Low futures margins allow investors to control large positions with low initial investments. The clear implication is that margin requirements affect intermarket risk and are not the private concern of a single marketplace. Nonetheless, it does not make sense to impose on all futures investors the stock margin requirement for individual investors. The stock index futures market is a professional market. Speculation by individual investors appears not to have been a serious problem in the October decline. Speculation by professional market participants is, however, a realistic concern. In the stock market, professionals are not subject to the 50% margin requirement applicable to individuals. Professionals, such as broker-dealers, can invest in stocks on 20% to 25% margin. The same professionals can take equivalent positions in stock through the futures market on much lower margin. To protect the intermarket system, margins on stock index futures need to be consistent with margins for professional market participants in the stock market. Such requirements need not produce equal margins on futures and stocks, but should reflect the different structure of the two related market segments. However, similar margins resulting in roughly equivalent risk and leverage between the two market segments are necessary to enforce consistent intermarket public policy objectives concerning leverage and speculation. Higher futures margins, in line with equivalent stock margins for professionals, need not hamper futures market makers and hedged futures participants. Consistent with the one market concept, cross-margining should be allowed. Market participants with an investment in futures should be allowed to receive credit for an offsetting or hedged investment in stocks or options. Cross-margining allows margin regulators to focus on the true intermarket risk exposure of participants rather than focusing myopically on a single market segment. In view of the October experience, the underlying logic of consistent margins for professional market participants in the one market system is compelling. If, from a public policy viewpoint, a given margin level for investment in stocks makes sense should lower margins and the potential for more financial leverage and speculative investment 
be allowed for market participants investing in stocks via derivative instruments? Should two margin requirements apply to what is, in effect, one market? Circuit breaker mechanisms. Circuit breaker mechanisms involve trading halts in the various market segments. Examples include price limits, position limits, volume limits, trading halts reflecting order imbalances, trading halts in derivatives associated with conditions in the primary marketplaces, and the like. To be effective, such mechanisms need to be coordinated across the markets for stocks, stock index futures, and options. Circuit breakers need to be in place prior to a market crisis, and they need to be part of the economic and contractual landscape. The need for circuit breaker mechanisms reflects the natural limit to intermarket liquidity, the inherently limited capacity of markets to absorb massive one-sided volume. Circuit breakers have three benefits. First, they limit credit risks and loss of financial confidence by providing a timeout amid frenetic trading to settle up and ensure that everyone is solvent. Second, they facilitate price discovery by providing a timeout to pause, evaluate, inhibit panic, and publicize order imbalances to attract value traders to cushion violent movements in the market. Finally, circuit breaker mechanisms counter the illusion of liquidity by formalizing the economic fact of life so apparent in October that markets have a limited capacity to absorb massive one-sided volume. Making circuit breakers part of the contractual landscape makes it far more difficult for some market participants, pension portfolio insurers, aggressive mutual funds, to mislead themselves into believing that it is possible to sell huge amounts in short time periods. This makes it less likely in the future that flawed trading strategies will be pursued to the point of disrupting markets and threatening the financial system. Thus, circuit breakers cushion the impact of market movements, which would otherwise damage infrastructures. They protect markets and investors. There are perceived disadvantages to circuit breaker mechanisms. They may hinder trading and hedging strategies. Trading halts may lock investors in, preventing them from exiting the market. However, circuit breakers in a violent market are inevitable. The October market break produced its own circuit breakers. The clogging of the DOT system for NYSE order processing and OTC trading systems. Ad hoc trading halts in individual stocks, in options and trading index futures. Jammed communication systems and some less than responsive specialists and market makers throughout markets. These market disorders became, in effect, ad hoc circuit breakers, reflecting the natural limits to market liquidity. The October 1987 market break demonstrates that it is far better to design and implement coherent coordinated circuit breaker mechanisms in advance than to be left at the mercy of the unavoidable circuit breakers of chaos and system failure. To be effective, circuit breaker mechanisms need to be rationalized across stocks, stock index futures, and option markets. Coordination is necessary to prevent intermarket failure of the kind experienced in October. 
The intermarket impact of trading halts was vividly illustrated in October. When the NYSE's automated stock order system, DOT, was rendered ineffective, index arbitrage became infeasible, robbing the index futures markets of much-needed buying power. From the narrow perspective of the stock market, an inactive DOT system may have appeared beneficial, since it made program selling difficult. However, this contributed to the development of a futures discount, which in turn put downward pressure on stock prices. Also, trading halts in NYSE stocks interfered with options in futures trading. Indeed, there are numerous examples in the October break of the impact of trading constraints in one marketplace on conditions in other marketplaces. Trading halts such as price limits are not the private concerns of individual market segments. Because they affect trading throughout the intermarket system, circuit breakers need to be coordinated from a broader intermarket perspective. In a crisis, the need for intermarket information and coordination of trading halts is imperative to avoid intermarket failure. Closing one market segment can have a destabilizing impact throughout the market system. An intermarket perspective facilitates a timely and effective response to crisis. Information Systems Intermarket information systems are currently insufficient to monitor the intermarket trading strategies that are so significant to the one market system. Intermarket monitoring systems are necessary to assess market conditions and to diagnose developing problems. The October experience illustrates the need for a trading information system incorporating the trade, time of the trade, and the name of the ultimate customer in every major market segment. This is critical to assess the nature and cause of a market crisis to determine who bought and who sold. This information can be used to diagnose developing problems, as well as to uncover potentially damaging abuses. The Futures Clearinghouse and Large Trader Information Systems currently allow assessment of trading time by trading customers. The stock exchanges have no system which details trades and trading times by customer. Stock systems include only the broker-dealers involved and whether the broker-dealer acted as principal or agent. Customer information for all market segments is critical to assessing threats to the intermarket system, and all major exchanges should be required to maintain such an information system. The October experience illustrates the need for information systems capable of monitoring conditions throughout the one market system. Conclusion One intermarket system mandates one agency to coordinate the few critical intermarket regulatory issues, clearing and credit arrangements, margins, circuit breakers, and information systems. This intermarket agency need not be involved in detailed intramarket regulatory issues in which the SEC the CFTC, and the self-regulatory organizations have expertise. The expertise required of the intermarket agency is evident from the nature of the task. In many respects, the problems associated with the October market break can be traced to intermarket failure. Institutional and regulatory structures 
designed for separate marketplaces were incapable of dealing with a precipitate intermarket decline, which brought the financial system to the brink. Although exchanges may not be pleased with the prospect of intermarket regulation, the task force has concluded it is essential to ensure the integrity of financial markets. It is important to note that, for the most part, this proposal does not involve substantial additional regulatory burdens. Rather, it involves the reallocation of existing responsibility to conform to new economic realities. Intermarket trading activities are an important innovation and contribute to the competitiveness of U.S. markets. These activities have evolved and grown rapidly during the past five years. The regulatory structure has not evolved in a corresponding manner and remains primarily an intramarket activity. This needs to be changed. The pressing need for coordination of intermarket issues is the chief lesson to be learned from the October experience. Rationalizing intermarket issues is the key to avoiding future market crises and ensuring the efficiency and competitiveness of U.S. markets. End of Section 7 Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island Section 8 of the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island Chapter 8 Conclusions On Thursday, October 22nd, following the stock market break earlier that week, the President announced the formation of the Task Force on Market Mechanisms. Its mandate was, in 60 days, to determine what happened and why, and to provide guidance in helping to prevent such a break from occurring again. The task force concludes that the precipitous decline in the stock market was characterized by large sales by a limited number of institutional investors throughout the interrelated system of markets, stocks, futures, and stock options. The massive volume, violent price volatility, and staggering demands on clearing and credit raised the possibility of a full-scale financial system breakdown. The task force also concludes that stocks, stock index futures, and options constitute one market, linked by financial instruments, trading strategies, market participants, and clearing and credit mechanisms. To a large extent, the problems in mid-October can be traced to the failure of these market segments to act as one. Institutional and regulatory structures designed for separate marketplaces were incapable of effectively responding to intermarket pressures. The activities of some market participants, such as portfolio insurers, were driven by the misperception that they were trading in separate, not linked, marketplaces. The simple conclusion is that the system grew geometrically with the technological and financial revolution of the 1980s. Many in government, industry, and academia failed to understand fully that these separate marketplaces are in fact one market. Nonetheless, that the market break was intensified by the activities of a few institutions illustrates the vulnerability of a market in which individuals directly own 60% of the equities. The experience underscores the need for immediate action to protect the equity market and financial system from the destructive consequences 
of violent market breaks. Our understanding of these events leads directly to our recommendations. To help prevent a repetition of the events of mid-October and to provide an effective and coordinated response in the face of market disorder, we recommend that one agency should coordinate the few but critical regulatory issues which have an impact across the related market segments and throughout the financial system. Clearing systems should be unified to reduce financial risk. Margins should be made consistent to control speculation and financial leverage. Circuit breaker mechanisms such as price limits and coordinated trading halts, should be formulated and implemented to protect the market system. Information systems should be established to monitor transactions and conditions in related markets. Analysis of the October episode also gives a clear view of the attributes required of an effective intermarket agency. These are expertise in the interaction of markets, not simply experience in regulating distinct market segments, a broad perspective on the financial system as a whole, both foreign and domestic, independence and responsiveness. The task force has neither the mandate nor the time to consider the full range of issues necessary to support a definitive recommendation on the choice of the intermarket agency. We are nevertheless aware that the weight of the evidence suggests that the Federal Reserve is well qualified to fill the role of the intermarket agency. End of Section 8 Recording by Patrick McAfee, Merritt Island End of Report of the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms by Nicholas F. Brady